Hey there, United States history students. Before we begin our study of John F. Kennedy and the Kennedy administration of the early 1960s, let's take a moment to look at what was going on with our arch rivals, the Soviet Union. Because if you were around in the United States of America in the early 1960s, the Soviets were starting to heat up the Cold War a little bit. They had a leader by the name of Nikita Khrushchev who was saying some pretty aggressive and intimidating things. And during the Kennedy administration, things really heated up between the United States of America and the Soviet Union. We almost went to war against each other. So what's going on with the Soviet Union? Well, let's learn about the Soviet Union at this period of time in history. We can better understand what happens during the Kennedy administration if we first understand our Soviet history of the early 1960s. So let's begin with this guy, Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev came to power in the year 1953. Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, the brutal dictator, the man who led collectivization, the purges, killed millions of Soviets, but also saved the Soviet Union from Nazism when Hitler attacked. He died in the year 1953. And there was a power vacuum after the death of Stalin. After all, who's going to lead the Soviet Union now? Stalin was unclear in terms of who his successor was going to be. So what happened in 1953? How did the Soviet Union determine its next leader? So the there was a governing body of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. They were called the Politburo. The best way to think of the Politburo is to think of them like the Congress of the Soviet Union. They were the Communist Party leaders. And they had to select who their next leader was going to be, and they chose this guy, Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev was the former Soviet commander at the Battle of Stalingrad. So you can't really doubt this guy's patriotism. Now it's interesting to look at what Khrushchev did when he came to power. He gave a speech in front of the Politburo. This was called the secret speech, even though it really wasn't all that secret. The word got out in terms of what he wanted to do with the Soviet Union pretty quickly afterwards. In this so-called secret speech, he stated openly that Stalin had committed atrocities against the Soviet people. He said it, and he said that this is going to change. And Khrushchev was going to usher in a new era of reform in which people were not going to live in at least as much fear as they did during the reign of Stalin. The terror, the purges, they were going to end and there would be greater freedom of speech in the Soviet Union. And there would be a lot of different type of reforms that would happen in, uh, in, in, in the agricultural industry and other production, areas of production. It was going to be a new era, an era of reform, an era of less repression. Okay, so... As an American, I would think this sounds great. I, I would assume that if I was living in the Soviet Union, I'd be like, yay, good, no more state terror. This is great. But here's what's amazing. As Khrushchev introduced his new policy of de-Stalinization, where there was going to be less state terror in the Soviet Union, the Politburo didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that Nikita Khrushchev had criticized his predecessor, Stalin. As bad as Stalin was, he still saved the Soviet Union during World War II. And it was not, it was very much against the custom of Russians for one leader to criticize another leader. So Khrushchev is now in the hot seat a little bit with the Politburo. And the Politburo, these individuals can remove him from power. So Khrushchev even though he's trying to do good things for the Soviet Union, he's now getting criticized. And things got even worse for Nikita Khrushchev. The Eastern Bloc communist countries, the countries that Stalin was pretty much controlling, they looked at this new policy of de-Stalinization as an opportunity to start to break off and go free and do their own thing separate from the Soviet Union. It started in 1956, and it started with Poland. And Poland, the head of state of Poland, began announcing that there would be reforms within Poland. This caused shock waves in the Politburo, and Khrushchev was forced to respond. He threatened the president of Poland. You change what you're saying, 
and the president changed what he was saying, and he doubled back, and Poland once again went under the control of the Soviet Union. What happened in Poland, though, inspired the country down south, Hungary. And there in Hungary, the president of Hungary said that they were going to do their own thing. Now, when the Soviets and Nikita Khrushchev threatened uh, the, the Hungarian leader, he refused to let down, and he encouraged a revolution in his own country. The Soviets had to go down into Hungary and brutally repress this revolution. Now the Politburo in the Kremlin in Moscow is really angry with Nikita Khrushchev, as if to say, they wanted to say, look at what you did, your de-Stalinization, your loosening of everything up. The Eastern Bloc countries are, are, are breaking free. We are looking weak. You need to make the Soviet Union strong again. If you were Nikita Khrushchev, how would you respond to this particular situation? You started off this new type of leader. You wanted to be a good guy. We're going to de-Stalinize the Soviet Union. There's going to be less state terror. There's going to be more freedom of speech. And then what happens? You get criticized by the Politburo. And then the Soviet bloc countries start saying, we don't want the Soviet Union anymore. Now the Soviet Union looks weak. How? Do you prove to the tough guys in the Politburo, the hardliners, that you are a strong, great leader? Well, there's one thing you can do. Antagonize the United States of America. And that helps us to understand why Nikita Khrushchev and the Soviet Union as a whole looks so mean if you're an American. It helps us to understand why the Soviets just start to seem to act evil and mean and do really incredibly aggressive things, even almost starting a third world war with us. Nikita Khrushchev is in a position where he really has to do this. Now, the one thing, the one big thing that he could do to really prove to the Politburo and to the Soviet Union and to the world that he is an even greater dictator then Joseph Stalin would be to do this one thing. Capture West Berlin. West Berlin, which is this island of democracy on the eastern side of the Iron Curtain. West Berlin, which Stalin described as a bone in our throats that he tried to capture in 1948 and make communist in 1948, but the Americans stopped with the Berlin airlift. Nikita Khrushchev starts to look at West Berlin and starts to think, I can get it. And he comes up with a very bold and aggressive plan to capture West Berlin in 1962. All right, so let's get into it. Now let's shift from the Soviet perspective back to the American perspective. Let's learn the story of John F. Kennedy and the Kennedy administration. Welcome to Camelot. All right, here we go. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was the fourth president in American history to be assassinated. The assassination happened on November the 22nd, 1963. The presidents who had been assassinated before John Kennedy were Abraham Lincoln, James Garfield, and William McKinley. This particular assassination, very similar to Abraham Lincoln's, came as a national shock. And really, it serves as a turning point in United States history. The culture and the feel of the United States of America changed after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. When John Kennedy died, he left behind two children, Caroline and John Jr., and his spouse, the widow Jackie Kennedy. Not long after the assassination, Jackie Kennedy was responding to journalists, asking her about her time in the White House. In describing what life in the White House was like and what being the First Lady was like, Jackie described it as being like Camelot. Camelot, the iconic, idyllic castle 
of the legendary King Arthur of England from the early Middle Ages. That image of the castle of Camelot, which is nothing but a legend, invoked such images of grandeur, of happiness, of perfection, of great leadership, that journalists clung to that term Camelot, and it became part of the Kennedy myth. Life during the Kennedy administration was certainly not as pleasant as how Jackie Kennedy, the former first lady, presented it. But that's also one of the great qualities of Jackie Kennedy. At this time of incredible national mourning, she had the ability and the grace to provide a particular image to the Kennedy administration and to the national government as a whole so that people, so that Americans could smile and be proud of what our country was like during the Kennedy years. The term Camelot stuck. So now, what we good students of United States history are gonna do is learn the real story of the Kennedy administration and what they went through. So let's get to it. Let's learn about the Kennedy administration and let's start it off with talking about the country of Cuba. Now we spent a lot of time learning about the country of Cuba when we talked about the Spanish-American War, otherwise known as the War of 1898, in which the United States of America drove the Spanish army off of Cuba. But then we didn't take over Cuba, but we helped the Cubans set up their own country with very favorable trade relations with the United States of America. Over the course of the first half of the 20th century, things did not improve much for the average Cuban, many of whom had a job as a manual laborer, and employment conditions were poor, there wasn't much economic opportunity, and the country was largely controlled by a handful of wealthy individuals who owned and controlled most of the land. It was an unfair situation, ripe for revolution, and the revolution finally happened in the year 1959 during the second half of the second term of President Eisenhower's administration. The Cuban Revolution was re led by two people, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, and it would be Fidel Castro who would emerge as the first president of this post-revolutionary Cuba. The big question was, what type of government was he going to set up? It was not eminently clear when Castro and Guevara took over Cuba what form of government they were going to establish to free the people of Cuba, to provide them with more opportunity. And Castro, in the late 1950s, even spent some time in the United States, giving some American politicians a sense of hope that Castro would establish a democracy similar to ours, and Cuba and the United States of America would move forward in friendly relations. But that's not the direction Castro took his country. Castro established a communist regime in Cuba. And therefore, Cuba would be on far more friendly terms with the Soviet Union than they would the United States of America. And this was somewhat of a frightening thing for many Americans. Because when Americans thought of communism between 1945 to 1959, it was something that was bad, that was a threat, that they didn't like, but at least it was on the complete other side of the world. The Soviet Union, China, it's way, way, way over there on the other side of the earth. Now, communism is right next door. And we heard this distance a lot when we talked about the Spanish-American War. Cuba is but a short 90 miles south of Key West, Florida. It's right there. They are our neighbors, our close neighbors. Communism isn't something that's on the other side of the earth now. It's right here in the Western Hemisphere, right there in the Caribbean, just south of Florida. And there was a sense that communism was spreading ever closer to us. And communism was also spreading into outer space. Which country is the first country in the history of humanity to successfully launch a man-made satellite into outer space? Well, that honor belongs to the Soviet Union that launched little Sputnik into outer space in October of 1957. Sputnik, which is the Russian word for travel buddy. This little Sputnik, this little travel buddy, would orbit the Earth and it would blink so you could see it. You could stand in a cornfield on the plains, or better yet, you could stand in the cornfield in the middle of Ohio, and you could look up in the night sky, and you could see little blip, blip, blip Sputnik going around the Earth. It also emitted a beep that you could tune into AM radio and listen to it. 
Sputnik was right there, and this scared the bejeebers out of the United States because not only had the Soviet Union beaten us into outer space, at a time we couldn't even launch a rocket off of the ground, we would joke that Russia had Sputnik and we had Flopniks because we couldn't even, we didn't have the rocket science ability yet to launch a rocket out, off the ground and get it into outer space. So not only had the Russians beaten us at that, but the fact is we could look up and we could see this man-made satellite floating over us. And if the Russians could put that in outer space, they could also launch a nuclear missile. They could put that in outer space and possibly have that hanging over our heads as well. So the Soviets are beating us at the, in the space race. Not only does that mean they've got the better scientists and engineers, but it also means that the Soviets could be a bigger threat. So they're in outer space. They're right next door in Cuba. Communism is more of a threat now. Also, who launched the first human being into space? The Soviets. The first man in outer space was Yuri Gagarin. How about breaking some gender barriers? Who was the first woman into outer space? Also a Soviet. Valentina Tereshkova. Yuri Gagarin went into outer space in 1961. Valentina Tereshkova went into outer space in 1963. And the Cold War just got a little hotter as we're entering into the 1960s. Communism's in Cuba, communism's in outer space. To help protect ourselves against the threat of communism and expanding communism, we do build a pretty incredibly cool spy plane. This is the U-2 spy plane. By the way, there's absolutely no association between the name of this plane and the rock band U-2, if you're familiar with that band. So here is the U-2 spy plane. What makes the spy plane a rather good spy plane is that it flies at an altitude of 70,000 feet. 70,000 feet is really high up in the air. When you get in a commercial air airliner, you're flying probably between 30,000 feet to 40,000 feet. So this is pretty much double the altitude that you would be flying if you, when you fly in a commercial airliner. 70,000 feet is at the edge of the Earth's atmosphere. So this is about as high up as you can go without going into outer space. And from this incredibly high altitude, the U-2 carries within it, in the belly of, a, of the plane, this incredibly powerful camera that can take detailed photographs of the, of the Earth 70,000 feet below. So it flies up way high, way up high, so it is difficult to detect this spy plane. And then it's got this powerful camera that can take detailed pictures of what's going on on the Earth below. So we can fly it over the Soviet Union, and we can see if they're constructing any nuclear missile sites or whatever we're looking for. And we're flying up so high that hopefully, hopefully, the Soviets don't see us and shoot the U-2. So when it came to trying to find pilots who would be daring enough to fly in these U-2 spy planes at 70,000 feet skirting the Earth's atmosphere, the CIA went to the United States Air Force to forcefully conscript some of the best pilots into flying one of these U-2 spy planes. Now, because the U-2 spy plane was such a precious thing and because these missions were, well, spying, and it's certainly not something that we ever wanted to get caught doing, all of the pilots were issued a small needle full of poison. And should they ever go down over the Soviet Union or other enemy territory, they were expected to commit suicide. Now, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, flying one of these elite high-tech spy planes was, for the most part, fairly safe because the Soviets, they didn't have missiles that, even if they could see these planes, the missiles, the, the surface-to-air missiles couldn't reach the planes and their own planes couldn't fly at such a high altitude, so they were relatively safe up high. But then, in the year 1960, one of our U-2 pilots, a man by the name of Francis Gary Powers, was shot down over the Soviet Union. Because the Soviet Union had been seeing these spy planes at 70,000 feet, and they worked hard on developing a surface-to-air missile which could reach the U-2 planes and shoot them down. And Francis Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union. The plane was coming crashing down. Did Gary Powers take his poison? No. He instead parachuted out of the U-2 plane and landed safely on the ground. Well, physically safely, but as soon as he touched ground, he was surrounded by Soviet soldiers who immediately captured him. 
All right, so Khrushchev had been complaining that the United States of America was flying spy planes over the Soviet Union, an allegation which our government repeatedly denied. And when Khrushchev con contacted the White House and let them know that one of their spy planes had crashed down over the Soviet Union, or I guess into the Soviet Union, the White House, and this was in the year 1960, so Dwight Eisenhower was still president, the White House responded, no, that was not a spy plane. It must have been a weather plane that blew off course. Assuming that the pilot, Gary Powers, had committed suicide and the plane had been destroyed beyond any type of recognition. If it had fallen from 70,000 feet in the air, it probably was completely destroyed when it hit the ground. But then the Soviet Union said, oh, but we captured the pilot and he's alive. And they were also able to salvage enough of the plane that they could easily document that this was indeed a spy plane. And the United States was humiliated and Eisenhower was caught in a bold-faced lie. Francis Gary Powers eventually came home. We had recently captured a Soviet spy in the United States and a spy trade was made on a bridge in between West Berlin and East Berlin. If you're interested in a, a very dramatic reenactment of this event, you should check out the film Bridge of Spies, which is about that spy trade. All right, so the United States of America, not looking too good, not looking too good. Eisenhower, caught in a lie. The Soviet Union beat us in a space race. We said we weren't spying, we were spying. And there was the sense as we go into the 1960s that the Soviet Union is just passing us by. Young people in the Soviet Union, they're studying advanced mathematics and rocket science. What are kids in the United States doing? Well, we're listening to rock and roll. There was the sense that the United States of America's power was going to be eclipsed by the Soviet Union. Nikita Khrushchev articulated this very succinctly when he made his famous proclamation to the United States of America we will bury you. Now, this is one of those quotes. These are, this is one of those statements that the Americans thought at the time was extraordinarily, an, uh, just an extraordinarily aggressive thing to say because to claim that we are going to be buried pretty much meant that, or a lot of Americans understood this as, well, the Soviets are saying that they're going to kill us. I mean, oh, you only get buried after you're dead. So this is an aggressive statement that the Soviets or at least Nikita Khrushchev is making, that they are going to kill the Americans. We will bury you. But here's what Nikita Khrushchev actually said in its entirety when he proclaimed, we will bury you. What he really meant was, we the Soviets are going to leave you Americans behind. Because, as he said, the United States of America was born in the year 1776. The Soviet Union was born in the year 1917. So the Soviet Union came along nearly 140 years after the United States of America. So the United States is old, the Soviet Union is young, and look at what the Soviet Union has done in such a short period of time. Based upon the trajectory of their technological developments, the Soviet Union was going to surpass the United States of America, and that's why Nikita Khrushchev said, we will bury you. What he was trying to say is, we are advancing at such a rate that we are going to leave the United States behind. Either way, it was a fearful time for the United States. Americans tended to believe strongly in their democracy, but they were fearful that the Soviets were doing a lot better in terms of their science and technology, and they possibly were going to surpass the United States of America and leave us behind. So all of that plays backdrop to the 1960 election. Eisenhower had already served two terms as president of the United States, so we're going to have both a new Republican candidate and a new Democratic candidate. And here are those two candidates. And at this point in time in your study of American history, you know both of them by now. On the left, the Democratic candidate, John F. Kennedy, the senator from Massachusetts. On the right-hand side of this picture, Richard Milhouse Nixon, the current vice president of the United States in the year 1960, and before that, you remember, he was the senator from California, who before that was famous for being a passionate, strident anti-communist. He had rose to national fame by pursuing Alger Hiss, claiming that he was a spy. Prior to that, Richard Nixon had served in, the, in, in World War II. Before that, he was a very good football player. Richard Nixon actually grew up in Los Angeles, California. 
Now, the campaign of 1960 was a very, very, very tight race. This was going to be a very close election, and both of the candidates knew this. And it was a no-holds-barred competition. Both Nixon and Kennedy were doing everything they possibly could to win this election. And I'll talk about some of the things that Kennedy did here in just a moment. One of the big events that happens in the 1960 campaign, and certainly the one that most Americans know about with the 1960 campaign, were the series of four live television debates that were broadcast between September and October of 1960. This was the first time in American history in which the two presidential candidates debated each other live on national television. Now, the television debates are commonplace in today's presidential campaigns. The strategies and the types of debating, or the methodologies that some candidates employ in the debates has evolved over the course of the years. But the presidential campaign debates, this tends to be one of the big events of the election year that many Americans pay attention to and enjoy tuning in and watching. It's interesting, it's educational, and it's also entertaining to watch the two presidential candidates spar it out. So 1960 was the first year this happened. Now, both candidates are very articulate. Both candidates are experienced politicians. They were a great match for each other. But the one thing that historians point out about the 1960 debates is that Kennedy looked good, and I mean just looked good superficially, whereas Richard Nixon did not. Richard Nixon, in the first debate, he didn't wear any makeup. When the lights went on him, he began to sweat. He kept matting the sweat up with a handkerchief. Doing this made him look, well, kind of sickly. Nixon looked older, whereas Kennedy looked younger, more handsome, nicer to look at, nicer to listen to. And arguably, this may have influenced some people. Now, some people believe that the 1960 election was a turning point in American history because of this TV debates, because we Americans became a little bit more superficial. I mean, after all, what's it matter how good-looking a presidential candidate is? If looks were important, it's hard to imagine Abraham Lincoln or George Washington being elected president. But now, in the television age, looks, well, they're important. So the 1960 television debates may have tipped a few Americans in the direction of Kennedy. And looking good was part of the Kennedy mystique. Kennedy looked a lot younger than Nixon, but in fact, he was only four years younger than Richard Nixon. But Kennedy was suave. He had a beautiful and graceful wife. This is a couple that didn't really look like politicians. They just they looked like they walked off the cover of a fashion magazine. So... Before we go any further with the 1960 election, let's go back and learn about where John F. Kennedy came from. All right, so let's learn about the Kennedy family. Here they are. It's a big one. We've got a mom and a dad and nine children. Learning a little bit about the Kennedy family does give you some insight into the Kennedy administration as why people still today are fascinated with the Kennedys. All right, so let's start with mom and dad. So the dad of the Kennedy family is Joe Kennedy. The mom is Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. Let's start with the dad first. Joe was the grandson of Irish immigrants. His own father was a barkeep. So Joe Kennedy certainly did not grow up with wealth, but he did work hard to acquire a great deal of money over the course of his life. Namely, he made his money in finance, and you may remember the story from the 1920s about how he was, uh, in the summer of 1929, listening to a shoeshine boy talk about how he had invested a great deal of money in the stock market and how wealthy he was getting. And that tipped Joe Kennedy off that the stock market might be experiencing a significant bubble right now and it was time to pull all of, all of his money out. And that saved uh, the, the Kennedy wealth. In the 1920s, during the Prohibition years and the rise of gangsters and bootlegging, Joe Kennedy also made money by helping to finance the mob. So Joe Kennedy had ties with mobsters. And that is always, of course, an interesting part of the uh, Kennedy story. Joe Kennedy, in the 19-teens and the 1920s, he used some of his money to help finance Hollywood films. So he also had connections to Hollywood. So Joe Kennedy was raised in the Boston area of Massachusetts. That's where his home was. The Kennedys are still today associated with Boston. But... 
In the 1920s, he would spend a great deal of time in Los Angeles, and he began having an affair with a famous Hollywood actress in the 1920s. This little seedy t tidbit is also a big part of the Kennedy story. Joe Kennedy had many mistresses, many girlfriends, many flings as a married man, and this was a habit that his son John F. Kennedy and his other sons would pick up on. All right, so that's Joe Kennedy. Let's move on to the mom, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. So right here you can see this is where John F. Kennedy got his middle name. It was his mom's maiden name. Rose's dad was the mayor of Boston. So Rose, as opposed to Joe, she did grow up with money and prestige and power. So Joe was very lucky to meet Rose and marry into such a powerful political family. And Rose Fitzgerald's family was, no surprise here, Democrats. All right, so there's the parents, Joe and Rose. Their first child was a boy. He was named after dad. Here is Joe Kennedy Jr. And Joe Kennedy Jr. was raised to be the president of the United States of America. His mom's family had all of these political connections. And from his dad, he learned toughness and competition and a drive to survive. And maybe it could have been that Joe Kennedy would have become the president of the United States, but he became a pilot during the Second World War. And by all accounts, he was a very brave pilot who even took on additional missions when he didn't have to. And Joe Kennedy died during the Second World War. His parents and his family honored him as a war hero, which of course he was. But now that he had passed away, all eyes turned to the second youngest to go into politics and maybe even become the next president of the United States. So here is the individual we are focusing on, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He had largely grown up in his brother's shadow. And some of you may experience this if you have an older brother or sister who's really smart and really athletic, it's tough to be that younger sibling. These two brothers were highly competitive with one another, but because Joe was older and he was such a great athlete and he was so smart at school, really an intelligent student, that the high school aged John Fitzgerald Kennedy, instead of trying to compete with that, he decided to instead just be the class clown. And so this sometimes happens, and you may be familiar with this feeling if you are the younger sibling of somebody who's really smart, really athletic, and the teachers and everybody say, oh, your, your, your big brother, your big sister, oh, they're so smart, they're so great. And that can get really annoying. It can get really frustrating. And some people respond, the younger siblings sometimes respond by just going in the opposite direction. And so John Fitzgerald Kennedy actually as a as a high schooler, had to go to summer school for several classes. Uh, this, this Everybody in this family went to an elite private school on the East Coast. It was called the Chode School. And John Kennedy had to do uh, some, some summer school because he failed classes. But his failing of these classes belied how very intelligent he was. All right, so the older oldest brother, Joe Kennedy, he dies during the Second World War. But the younger three boys all go into politics, so we know who John Fitzgerald Kennedy is. The young boy there in the middle, that's Ted Kennedy, who will go on to become a senator from Massachusetts until he dies in the early 21st century. And then we've also mentioned in the previous lecture, John F. Kennedy's younger brother, Bobby Kennedy. Here he is. I put his full name down, Robert Francis Kennedy. He will be the attorney general for uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, Bobby Kennedy will pursue law but then becomes an attorney general of the United States in 1961 for his big brother's administration. Um, after John F. Kennedy is assassinated and Lyndon Johnson takes over, Bobby Kennedy didn't really like Lyndon Johnson all that much, and so he quits the job, and then later on runs for president himself in the year 1968, and sadly, Bobby Kennedy is assassinated in 1968. He was one of the two big 1968 assassin. <laughs> He was one of the two big uh, uh, assassinations of the of the night of night of the year 1968. Pardon me as I stumble over my words. Bobby Kennedy was killed in 1968, and so was Martin Luther King Jr. Many people think that Bobby Kennedy could have become president in 1968 had he not been assassinated. Okay, let me talk about two of the Kennedy daughters here, and the first one here is Rosemary Kennedy. There are a lot of tragedies with the Kennedy family. Two of these children died during World War II, both in plane crashes. You know, later on, John F. Kennedy is going to get assassinated, then Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated. But for me, one of the saddest tragedies of the Kennedy family is the story of Rosemary Kennedy. So Rosemary Kennedy was cognitively delayed. In other words, she was mildly mentally disabled. However, she still went all the way through school. She still went to college, and she got a teaching license 
she endeavored to become a kindergarten teacher, but she never had the opportunity to do that because Joe Kennedy was nervous that his mildly me mentally disabled daughter would somehow embarrass the family. So to make sure that Rosemary didn't do anything or say anything in public that would ever embarrass this highly public and ambitious family, Joe Kennedy did something that I personally find nearly unforgivable. He unilaterally made a decision. He did not consult his wife, the mother of Rosemary, and had Rosemary sent to a hospital where she would undergo a surgery called a prefrontal lobotomy. So a prefrontal lobotomy is a, uh, is a form of brain surgery that does not kill you, but it simply disables you. It makes it so you can't talk or interact with other people. To put it rather crudely, you're just sort of a lump. You just sit a, sort of sit in a chair all day. And this prefrontal lobotomy in the, in the 20th century, it was used really on severely mentally disabled uh, uh, mental patients, individuals who are a severe threat to themselves and to others who otherwise had to be placed in a straitjacket. You would only perform a surgery like this on a severely mentally disabled person. Of course, today, if there's somebody with some sort of severe mental disability like this, likely they would receive medication to sedate them. But this is what happens to Rosemary Kennedy. As the surgery was described, a small portion of her skull was opened up. She was kept aware. You can undergo brain surgery with very little anesthesia because there are no nerve endings on your brain. So all you gotta do is shave some hair, cut into the skin, cut open the scalp, expose the brain, and the surgery can begin. And what they did to Rosemary Kennedy was they had her talk. They had her do things like recite the Lord's Prayer, just keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. And they began inserting knives into the prefrontal cortex of the brain, severing nerves in the brain until she wasn't talking anymore. And then that was it. Joe informed his wife and family that the surgery had happened to their sister and daughter, and they could never really interact with Rosemary much ever again. And she spent the remainder of her life behind closed doors in a hospital. So I personally can't ever imagine doing this to a child. And she wasn't even a child at that, she was a young, a young woman, but I can't imagine doing this to one of your own children, especially without consulting your spouse. But this was the drama of the Kennedy family. Now, the story of Rosemary Kennedy actually has a little bit of a happy ending because of her sister. All of the Kennedy kids were really upset by this story, by what happened to their, to their sister Rosemary. But Eunice Kennedy decided to make it her life mission to fight for the rights of the cognitively disabled and to provide dignity with people or to provide dignity for people with special needs. So Eunice Kennedy went on to found the Special Olympics. Okay, so there's a little bit of background on the Kennedy family there. Let's focus our attention on John F. Kennedy. So John F. Kennedy had a secret that he tried to keep his entire life and that secret was this. He was sick and in pain throughout most of his life. He had an ailment called Addison's disease. Addison's disease is an adrenal disorder. One of his legs was sh slightly shorter than, than the other. He had chronic back pain. As president of the United States, he had in the Oval Office this rocking chair, which becomes this sort of iconic element of the Kennedy White House. But he needed that rocking chair because he was in pain and the rocking chair provided him with some relief when he sat down. He also took a cocktail of pills every day to help him keep his energy up because with, with, with Addison's disease, you're constantly struggling against being tired all the time. In order to keep his energy up, John F. Kennedy's doctor put him on a fairly steady diet of steroids. But Kennedy worked hard to keep this covered up his entire life. He really worked hard on his image. I mean, he looked very physically fit. He played football. As a politician, he was always on the campaign trail. He was always doing things. He never sort of wanted to show his weakness. And all of his biographers report on how really just this was a, this was a superhuman feat to be John F. Kennedy because he lived his life in chronic pain. He also, as a young man, missed quite a bit of school because he was hospitalized so much with Addison's disease. And here's the spelling of Addison's disease, if you're interested. But spending so much time in a hospital as a young man, and this picture here is of, is of uh, John F. Kennedy in high school, spending time in bed after recovering from a stay in the hospital. 
one of the things that spending so much time in a hospital bed or spending so much time in a bed and spending so much time sick as a, as a young man did to John F. Kennedy was two things, two things. One, he learned to schmooze, which is, of course, always a great quality for a politician. And I like this picture because you sort of get a sense of that here. He learned to schmooze. It was very embarrassing for him to be sick all the time and probably being raised a Kennedy in this highly competitive, very athletic family. He didn't like being seen as an invalid. So when people came into his room, he'd smile, he'd laugh, he'd, he'd, he'd crack jokes. He would give you the feeling that, hey, everything's all right with this guy. And you forgot about how sick he was. This was an incredible social skill, which is obviously going to serve him very well in politics. The second thing about spending so much time in bed, and let's remember this is the 1930s when John F. Kennedy was in high school. There is, of course, no cell phones and there's no television yet. He spent a great deal of time reading. He became a voracious reader and he became a very fast reader, fast beyond my own comprehension. John F. Kennedy started reading a thousand pages a week. He would plow through two to three books per week. And that was a habit he kept up his whole life long. Even when he was president of the United States, he remained a voracious reader. So being sick all the time, dealing with chronic pain, it did teach John F. Kennedy to schmooze, and it turned him into a reader. Joe Kennedy encouraged his two oldest boys, Joe Jr. and John, to compete with one another. When they were in elementary schools, he would plop them in the pool and say, all right, let's see who can swim to the other side the fastest. Whoever wins gets to have dinner. Whoever loses has to go to bed hungry. This was the parenting style of Joe Kennedy Sr. And it definitely reflects uh, how much he had to compete and fight and struggle as a businessman growing up. He felt uh, a great deal of discrimination as an Irish Catholic. In Joe Kennedy's experience, it doesn't matter how hard you work, how much money you make, the waspy elites of New England, they will never let you have the same power and prestige that they have. For Joe Kennedy, life is a fight. Life is a struggle. So if you're, you're a boy, you've got to be tough. Joe Kennedy went to Harvard. That's Joe Kennedy Jr. Joe Kennedy Jr. went to Harvard. And then when uh, John expressed interest in going someplace else, Yale or Princeton, his dad told him, yeah, I knew you couldn't handle being in the same school with your brother. You can't handle the competition with your brother. And in response to that, John F. Kennedy, even though he didn't want to go to Harvard, went to Harvard too, just to prove his dad wrong. So Joe Kennedy, as you remember, withdrew much of his family investments out of the stock market in the summer of 1929. So when the stock market crash of October of 29 happens and the United States plunges into a Great Depression, the Kennedy family has all of its money. And this money then becomes even more valuable because everything becomes extraordinarily cheap because it's the Great Depression. So the Kennedy family, the Kennedy kids grow up pretty far removed from the Great Depression. The pain and the suffering of most Americans is pretty far removed from them, or they were at least pretty far removed from all that pain and suffering of the Great Depression in the 1930s. And everything was so cheap that dad decides to buy a couple of mansions where his family can spend their time, including this one in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. This mansion is otherwise known as the Kennedy Compound. And then that big beautiful house wasn't enough. He bought this house in West Palm Beach, Florida. When John F. Kennedy becomes president, he'll spend a lot of time here, especially during the colder months, giving this mansion the nickname the Winter White House. Growing up on the Atlantic Ocean in both places, the Kennedys grew up spending a great deal of time sailing. Sailing would remain for John F. Kennedy one of his favorite pastimes throughout all of his life. Now in the late 1930s, things get pretty exciting for the Kennedy family. The Great Depression is on, Franklin D. Roosevelt, a Democrat, is in the White House, and Franklin D. Roosevelt selected Joe Kennedy to be the chairman of a federal organization called the SEC. The SEC stands for the Security and Exchange Commission, and the job of the SEC is to identify and prosecute people who are doing illegal things in finance. So pursuing people who are doing like insider trading on Wall Street. So people were rather astounded that, uh, that Franklin D. Roosevelt would, would have chosen Joe Kennedy to be the chairman of the SEC because well, Joe Kennedy himself had engaged in a lot of insider trading back in the 1920s. Joe Kennedy himself was 
by all accounts a financial scam artist who had ties with the mob. But when President Roosevelt would, was asked, why did you choose Joe Kennedy to be the head of the SEC? Roosevelt's famous response was, you hire a thief to catch a thief. So in the 1930s, Joe Kennedy helped to regulate Wall Street. Then in the late 1930s, Joe Kennedy was um, appointed the American ambassador to the United Kingdom. And it's the late 1930s. That means World War II is getting ready to start. Now, the picture that you're looking at here is of Joe Kennedy with Winston Churchill. But before Winston Churchill comes to power, which happens during World War II, Joe Kennedy was in the United Kingdom interacting with the previous Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain is the man who, hopefully you remember, signed the Munich Pact with Adolf Hitler in September of 1938. The Munich Pact, that famous example of appeasement, where Britain and France just said, hey, Hitler, here you go, take this little bit of Czechoslovakia, but make a promise that you're not going to take any more. And of course, Hitler said yes, and then of course, Hitler broke that promise, and France and England had been duped. They thought that Hitler didn't want, want a war, and they thought wrong. All right, so Joe Kennedy was there in London when the British government supported the Munich Pact, and Joe Kennedy openly supported Neville Chamberlain. Joe Kennedy proclaimed, as uncomfortable as it is, democracies and dictatorships have to live side by side in the same world, whether we like it or not. That's what Joe Kennedy said. Democracies and dictatorships have to live side by side in the same world, whether we like it or not. Kennedy supported the appeasement of Hitler. Now, that being said, his son, John Kennedy, did not. John was at Harvard at the time, and later on in history, biographers who met with John F. Kennedy's Harvard buddies, these guys reported that John strongly disagreed with his dad, saying, no, you cannot just believe that Hitler is going to agree to these terms, the terms of the Munich Pact, and Hitler's bad. You have to fight dictatorships. You should fight for democracy. Now, this was happening behind closed doors. This was happening in private conversations between John and his college buddies. But here is what John did. He went to England to spend time with his dad. He actually spent time in Berlin. John F. Kennedy spent time in Berlin right before the advent of World War II. And then when World War II began in 1939, John F. Kennedy began doing research in London. He wanted to know why the British were, were so willing to appease Hitler, why they didn't want to fight for democracy. All right, so his dad is the ambassador to England. So college kid John F. Kennedy had access to private letters and to very hard-to-get government documents about the decision-making that was happening among government officials in London regarding how they wanted to deal with Germany. He takes all that information, all that research that he did, and he writes his senior thesis at Harvard. The title of his paper was Appeasement at Munich. But because it was so good, and what made it so good was John F. Kennedy had access to these, I can't call them top secret documents because they weren't top secret, but they certainly were documents from the British government and from people pretty high up in the British government that, that, that very few people would have been able to see. John F. Kennedy just had the smarts to collect all of these and to write about it in his college thesis, and that's what made it good. And so because it was so good and because it was so timely, he was able to take his college thesis and publish it as a book. He did change the title from the rather boring Appeasement at Munich to Why England Slept, which is a little bit more dramatic. He was a 22-year-old college kid. He graduates from Harvard, and he gets his senior thesis published as a book. Not a bad way to start your adult career. And it's here where I'm going to pause the lecture and ask you this little trivia question. There's been one other president in American history that we have learned about that graduated from Harvard and his senior thesis became a published work. Take a moment, think about it. Now, Theodore Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy, they were definitely different types of men, but there are a couple things that make their presidency and their political careers strikingly similar. They both went to Harvard. They both wrote a senior thesis during while they were at Harvard that became published books, 
And then Theodore Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy are the youngest people to ever be president of the United States. Now, who was the youngest president of the United States? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Remember, Theodore Roosevelt inherited the presidency after McKinley was assassinated. So Theodore Roosevelt technically is the youngest president in American history. When McKinley was assassinated and Theodore Roosevelt was sworn in as president, he was 42 years old. But he wasn't actually elected president. That won't happen until the year 1904. And in 1904, he's 46 years old when he's elected president. Still, both of those ages very young for a president. John F. Kennedy, when he was elected president in the year 1960, and also upon his inauguration in, in January of 61, he was 43 years old. Just one year shy of being the youngest president in American history. So, and I know this is kind of a silly, trivial thing, who was the youngest president in American history? Well, Theodore Roosevelt. He was 42 when he became president. But if you want to ask who is the youngest person ever to be elected president, well, then that's John F. Kennedy. He was 43 when he was elected. Theodore Roosevelt was an aged 46 when he was elected in 1904. All right. <laughs> Back to more substantial history. World War II is on. You know what happened, sadly, to Joe Kennedy during the Second World War. Uh, and Joe Kennedy was in Europe. John Kennedy volunteered for the United States Navy. Now, you remember John Kennedy was very, very sick. He had Addison's disease. He did not pass his physical. And here's where he relied, not for the first or the last time, on his dad's connections to get what he wants. And it's really interesting. It says a lot about John F. Kennedy's character that he has his dad uses political connections to get John F. Kennedy into the United States Navy. But not just that, John F. Kennedy wanted to be on the front lines. So he went into a one-year in intensive training program to become an officer on something called a PT boat. So here is in this picture on the far right, Lieutenant John Kennedy, and his PT crew on their PT-109 boat. PT stands for Patrol Torpedo. And what the PT boats would do was go out usually at night to patrol the waters of the Pacific under the cover of darkness. And these ships were supposed to be small and fast so that they could torpedo an enemy ship, turn around, get out of there. These tended to be rather dangerous missions. John F. Kennedy and his crew, they were stationed in 1943 on Guadalcanal. That would have been after the Battle of Guadalcanal was over. And the Americans had, uh, they, they were in control of that island. And they would go out on these night patrols to find and possibly fire upon Japanese ships. On one patrol in early August of 1943, John Kennedy's PT-109 boat was hit by a Japanese destroyer. Now, when I say hit... I mean that the boat, the Japanese destroyer, actually drove into their PT boat. The Japanese destroyer probably didn't even know that that PT boat was there. Uh, but, the, but the Japanese destroyer rammed into it and it split PT-109 in half. There were 13 men on board, including John Kennedy. Two of them died. One of them was seriously injured. And it was Lieutenant Kennedy's job to get these guys all together in the water, to rally them together, and then to swim all together to a nearby island. Kennedy successfully did that. The 11 men who survived the crash made it to that island. Again, one of the men was uh, uh, struggling to hold on to his life at that point of time. But surviving on that island was particularly difficult. They were in Japanese-controlled waters. They didn't have any fresh water on the island. They had to collect the fresh water from rain. And as several days went by, they started to become increasingly desperate. So John F. Kennedy decided to do something to save his men. And it, it famously involved a coconut and some of the native islanders. So John Kennedy took a coconut from the island and he scratched a message on it about how the crew of PT-109 was located on this particular island. And he gave it to one of the native islanders, somebody who would have been neutral in, this, uh, in, in World War II and who would have not have spoken any English but this would have been, the native islanders would have been able to travel throughout the South Pacific unharmed by the Japanese. So in whatever way he could, John Kennedy asked for one of these native islanders to deliver this coconut to another island where there were his allies. So in other words, deliver it to another American, British, Australian, somebody else out there in the South Pacific who could 
notify the authorities and get these men rescued off the island. Of course, the risk that John F. Kennedy was running with the native islander was that this coconut was going to somehow end up in the hands of the Japanese, and the Japanese would visit the island and capture or kill the men there. Or that this nothing would happen with this coconut, and nobody would ever find out about him, and they would all die. But the coconut made it to the Allies, specifically to the Australians, who notified the Americans, who were able to go, get to the island to rescue the 11 men that had made it there alive. The coconut made its way back to John Kennedy. And here you see the, Ken here you see the coconut. John Kennedy had the coconut encased in glass or plastic or whatever. And when he became a politician and, a, and then when he became the president of the United States, he always kept this coconut on his desk to remind him no matter how bad things get on his job, it would never be as bad as it was back then. When in August of uh, 1943, he felt fairly hopeless that he was going to die of starvation on an island. It was not, not long after the uh, PT-109 boat crash and Kennedy's rescue that he found out that his older brother had died flying dangerous missions over Europe. So John Kennedy returned home to Massachusetts not long after that. His older brother dead, all eyes turned to him to be the great politician of the family, and he was a war hero. And that being a war hero certainly helped him in his campaign, or rather in his many campaigns, because John F. Kennedy jumped right into politics. In 1947, not but two years after the end of World War II, not but four years after his PT-109 debacle, 1947, John F. Kennedy was 30 years old. No past political experience before this, he uses his war hero status and his family connections to run for the United States Congress, and he wins it. He's a congressman from 1947 to 1953, then he decides he wants to become a senator. He campaigns for the Senate in 1952, he gets it. He's one of the youngest senators in American history. He was not one of the more popular Democratic senators. I'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. But he's a senator from 1953 to 1960, and then he's elected president in 1960. The dates here are a little, uh, a little bit misleading because he's not president from 1960 to 1963. He's president from 1961 to 1963. He was, of course, elected in 1960, but doesn't uh, become president until January of 61. Sorry about that. So now John F. Kennedy, as this popular, young war hero from a rich, East Coast, famous family. He certainly enjoyed, enjoyed the spotlight, and he also very much enjoyed all the attention from women that being one of the most eligible bachelors in the United States of America brought him. And John F. Kennedy famously had many, 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 many girlfriends, including, a little bit like his dad, some famous Hollywood actresses. Probably most famous was his alleged affair with the famous actress, Marilyn Monroe during the early 1960s. Both John F. Kennedy and his younger brother Bobby Kennedy were suspected to have had a relationship with Marilyn Monroe in the early 1960s. This would have been while John F. Kennedy was president. I'm sorry to let you down, students. I honestly have not come across enough evidence from my limited knowledge on this particular topic to state with certainty that either one of those two Kennedy brothers had a relationship with Marilyn Monroe. I just simply can't say definitively, yes, it happened or no, it didn't. So sorry to let you down with that. But back to the early political career of John F. Kennedy and his many, many, many love interests, or at least romantic flings. Love is probably not the right word to use here. Romantic flings is probably much better. Anyway, his dad, Joe Kennedy, who lived the same lifestyle, he told John that as a politician, he had to get married. Because, Joe said to his son, if you are an unmarried man and you are just a bachelor well into your 30s, then the American public are going to think that you are either A, a playboy, or B, a homosexual. Either way, that's a bad image and you won't get elected into a higher office. So Joe Kennedy encouraged his son to get married. And so, in the year 1953, he did. Jacqueline Bouvier came from a wealthy New York family. In college, she studied French, and she even spent some time studying at the University of Paris at the Sorbonne. She was fluent in French. After college, she became a photographer for the Washington Times-Herald newspaper, 
She was extraordinarily intelligent. She will always be remembered for having this incredible sense of style and fashion. And by most, people, most people's accounts, she was extraordinarily beautiful. She was a perfect match for John F. Kennedy, except for the fact that John Kennedy would never be faithful to her. According to at least two of Jackie Kennedy's biographers, Darwin Porter and Danforth Prince, Jackie grew so disgusted with John F. Kennedy so early on in the 1950s that she threatened to divorce him. And Papa Joe Swo got involved and gave Jackie Kennedy $1 million simply so she wouldn't divorce his son, and thus probably ruining his political career. That's the first thing Jackie Kennedy had to put up with. The next thing was she sadly suffered multiple miscarriages. And also in the year 1960, she gave birth to a stillborn daughter. And throughout all of this, these physical traumas of not having children and her, and her husband's infidelity, she kept all of this very secret and very private and always famously maintained an air of grace and fashion. My favorite story of Jackie Kennedy was when uh, the Kennedys went to France and they got to meet the president of France, who was uh, one of the most famous presidents in French history, a man by the name of Charles de Gaulle. And when the first lady met Charles de Gaulle, President de Gaulle, she spoke to him fluently in French and he was just bowled over by her. He was enamored by the American first lady speaking to him in French, this beautiful young woman. And that was Jackie Kennedy. She had the amazing ability to charm anybody. So they were married in 1953, the same year that he was a senator. And as a senator, he spent a lot of time not being in the Senate. He spent a lot of time in Florida while Senate was in session. And this started to upset and to irk the Democratic majority leader, a man by the name of Lyndon Johnson from Texas. Now, John F. Kennedy might not have been in the Senate in part because he was shirking his duties, but it's also because he was extraordinarily sick, too. In 1954, John F. Kennedy had gotten so ill with Addison's disease that he pretty much couldn't get around without the use of crutches. And even that was exhausting for him. So he decided to do a very dangerous surgery. And the surgery was going to be done on his spine. He was given a 50-50 chance of survival. But Kennedy said, I'd rather be dead than spend my life in a wheelchair. Goes through the surgery. The surgery is successful. He's transferred to his home in West Palm Beach, Florida, and there, while in recovery, he decides to write a book. All right, so John F. Kennedy is a young senator, and he's a Democrat. Now, in 1954, the Republicans controlled the Senate. They also controlled the House of Representatives, and the minority leader for the Senate was the Democrat from Texas, Lyndon B. Johnson, as I said before. And Johnson was annoyed with Kennedy for two reasons. One, he was actually rarely there in the Senate. And two, when he was there voting on particular issues, on particular bills that were going to become law, Kennedy didn't always vote the party platform. He didn't always vote the way the majority of Democrats were voting. Now, Lyndon Johnson, the leader of the Democrats in the Senate, it's his job to make sure that all the Democrats vote for the things that he wants them to vote for. And he doesn't like that this young East Coast rich boy whippersnapper is not always voting in line with the rest of the Democratic Party. And Johnson was really good at <laughs> persuading politicians to do what he wanted them to do. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was very tall. He was Texan. He used very colorful language. And Johnson was renowned for cornering you when he wanted you to do something and just leaning over you and giving you what other politicians called the Johnson treatment, smiling in your face, talking down at you, persuading you to commit to supporting the legislation that he wanted you to support. And he was not able to do that with Kennedy. Okay, so back to 1954, John F. Kennedy's in recovery from a surgery, and he writes a book. Okay, so John Kennedy wrote this book, Profiles in Courage. Profiles in Courage is a series of of nonfiction stories about senators throughout American history who have stood up for what they felt was right. They voted their conscience and in so doing, lost their jobs. So in other words, it's the stories of politicians who didn't act like politicians, but rather voted for what they felt was truly best for the country. So for example, one of the chapters in Profiles in Courage 
was about the senator from Texas in, 18, in the 1850s, Sam Houston. And yes, the city of Houston, Texas is named after Sam Houston. Sam Houston, a Texan, spoke up against slavery and he voted his conscience. He voted against legislation that would have passed or would have uh, allowed for slavery to expand into the Western states. He voted against that. And because he did that, he was voted out of office. So it's interesting that Kennedy would write this book since he himself was pretty good at not voting in the same way that the Democratic leader, Lyndon Johnson, wanted him to vote. So that's Profiles in Courage. It is a good, very well-written and engaging book. But the other thing you should know about Profiles in Courage is, well, he probably didn't write it. John F. Kennedy had a friend from Harvard named Ted Sorensen. According to Ted Sorensen, John Kennedy gave him a manuscript for Profiles in Courage that he described was very disorganized and very poorly written. There were good ideas that were in this manuscript, but in terms of its readability, it was just plain awful. Not to mention the fact that John F. Kennedy's handwriting was atrocious. But Ted Sorensen, he took those manuscripts, cleaned it up, and in all likelihood, Ted Sorensen should receive at least a co-writing credit for Profiles in Courage, but he never did. When Profiles of Courage was released in the year 1956, it immediately shot to the top of the nonfiction bestseller list. And the reason why it shot to the top of the New York of the bestseller list was because Joe Kennedy, John Kennedy's dad, personally bought the first 10,000 copies. That way, his son could become famous for being a great writer, too. Hey, not to mention a great historian. Ted Sorensen would go on to become the president's speechwriter, which is what you see here when John F. Kennedy became president. 1956 was a presidential election year. Incumbent Rep Republican President Eisenhower was going to run for a second term, and he was contested by the Illinois Democrat Adlai Stevenson. Eisenhower would completely destroy Stevenson in the election of 56. But here's what makes the election of 1956 rather interesting. When you are a presidential candidate, it's usually you who chooses who your vice presidential running mate's going to be. But Adlai Stevenson, he did something that I think has never happened before or since in American history, which is he had his own party vote on who they wanted to run with them. So he didn't choose his vice presidential running mate, but rather he put it to the 1956 Democratic National Convention. He said, you choose. Who do you want? I don't think that's ever happened before or since in American history. I could be wrong, but I've, I've certainly never heard of this happening before or since. So anyways, one of the people was, of course, John Kennedy. But John Kennedy didn't get it. He came in second place. And in 1956, John F. Kennedy has to give a concession speech. This was not a concession speech that he was, uh, he, was, he was prepared to give. I mean, he wasn't running for any office. All of a sudden, he's selected to be the vice presidential running mate. He's pretty excited about it when it happened. But then when he didn't get it and went to somebody else, he had to stand up in front of the Democratic National Convention and give this speech. And when he gives this speech... He's downtrodden, he's morose, he's angry because John Kennedy doesn't like to lose. And this sort of lights a fire under his belly when 1960 rolls around. <laughs> Light a fire under his belly. I'm not sure if that's the right metaphor. Lights a fire under his booty. How about that? To get up and go and to actually run for president in the year 1960. Again, he's 43 years old. He is a young man. And again, the youngest man to ever run for president and get elected. Now, the 1960 election was a close election. It was Kennedy versus Nixon. There were the famous TV debates. Many historians say that those TV debates tipped the election slightly in the favor of Kennedy, and that might have helped him win, but there was also a whole lot going on behind the scenes. John Kennedy's dad, Joe Kennedy, had ties to the mob. Hopefully you remember that from Joe Kennedy helping to finance the Rum Runners in the 1920s. And there is some substantial evidence that the mob was fixing votes. The conservative British historian Paul Johnson goes into this in some depth in his massive book on American history called A History of the American People, in which he loosely 
list all the voter fraud that happened in the 1960 election. For example, he identified, well, he said that in a polling station in Texas, although he doesn't say specifically which one or where in Texas, there were 4,895 registered voters, but during the 1960 ele election, there were 6,138 votes that were cast, which of course seems highly suspicious. At the same time, Paul Johnson didn't identify specifically which one. But the mob does seem to have gotten involved in some level in the 1960 election. This is a far more juicier tidbit here. In the 1990s, a woman by the name of Judy Exner wrote a memoir stating that she had been a mistress of John F. Kennedy in 1960. And at the same time, she was also a mistress to the mob boss of Chicago, a man by the name of Sam Giancana. Judith Exner was her married name back in 1960. Her, uh, her maiden name was uh, Judith Campbell, or Judy, as she went by. And so she was romantically involved with, uh, claimed to be romantically involved with both Kennedy and the mob boss of Chicago at the same time. And according to her memoir, which came out in the 1990s, Sam Giancana said to her, Listen, honey, if it wasn't for me, your boyfriend wouldn't be in the White House suggesting that the Chicago mob was heavily involved in the 1960 election. Now, in the 1960 election, John Kennedy doesn't put it to a vote who's going to be his vice president, but rather chooses who his vice president candidate is going to be, or who his running mate's going to be. And he chose Lyndon B. Johnson, who's older than him, who doesn't necessarily like him all that much, but politically, this relationship made sense. Lyndon B. Johnson is the majority leader, or excuse me, the 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 minority leader of the Senate. He's the leader of the Democratic Party in the Senate. He is a highly successful politician, and better yet, he's a Southerner. So Kennedy was doing something called balancing the ticket. When you run for president, you want as your running mate somebody who's, lot di who, who's different from you in that that person is going to capture a different demographic of voters. So, for example, more recently in American history, during the 2020 election, you had the Democratic candidate for president, Joe Biden, who is an older white male, and he chooses for his running mate, Kamala Harris, who is a younger African-American woman. Obviously, these are going to attract different uh, a different demographic of voters. So you're going to get more people voting for the Biden-Harris ticket. So the same thing in 1960, you had John F. Kennedy. He's from a rich, upper-class, northeastern family, and he chooses as his running mate this Texan, Lyndon B. Johnson, who did not come from a wealthy family, but rather was a poor boy from rural Texas. He was very much inspired by uh, President Roosevelt during the Great Depression. And Lyndon B. Johnson, one way you can understand Lyndon B. Johnson as a politician is he was trying to be the next Franklin D. Roosevelt in nearly everything he did, which made him both a good president and a bad president when Lyndon Johnson becomes president. But we're not there yet. So the 1960 election goes down. It was close, close, close. Here's one way of looking at the, how close the 1960 election was. John F. Kennedy defeated Richard Nixon by less than two-thirds of 1% of the popular vote. It was close. And there were so many shady things that happened in the 60 election that one of the most respected historians of American history said, we will probably never know who won the 1960 election. That's Stephen Ambrose an American historian who died in the early 21st century. And he also wrote uh, fairly substantial biographies on Richard Nixon and uh, Dwight David Eisenhower. One of the things that's interesting about uh, John F. Kennedy's campaign was he tried to out-Republican the Republicans. It's always a good strategy when you're running for president is to try to say things that's going to appeal to the voter from the opposite side. So it had been the Republicans who had been seen as the staunch anti-communist. Now, John F. Kennedy had a history of being a passionate anti-communist, and what he wanted to do was be an even more passionate anti-communist than Richard Nixon. Now, Richard Nixon had become a popular politician for attacking Alger Hiss and accusing Alger Hiss of being a spy. That's what made Richard Nixon famous. That's what enabled him to become the vice president of the United States in the 1952 election. So John F. Kennedy decides he's going to be a more passionate anti-communist than Nixon. So how do you do that? Well, he did it by lying. John F. Kennedy on the campaign argued that the Americans had 
fallen behind the Soviet Union in terms of missile production. He stated that the Soviet Union had more missiles than the United States of America and therefore the United States of America was vulnerable to attack by the Soviet Union and they would not and we would not be able to retaliate and so if there was ever a war between the Soviet Union and the United States we would lose. Okay. First of all, this was not true. There was no substantial missile gap between the United States of America and the Soviet Union, but it was something that John F Kennedy still said to get people who were fearful of the Soviet Union attacking the United States of America who might otherwise have voted Republican to start to drift to the Democratic Party, maybe get a few of those votes away from the Republicans. It was an interesting strategy, and, of course, Kennedy won. But, of course, there was obviously a lot more going on than just Kennedy proclaiming there was a missile gap in the 1960 election. But it was an interesting strategy. All right. Once elected in November of 1960, John Kennedy begins the process of creating his presidential cabinet. And Kennedy collected what historians later refer to as the best and the brightest, mostly very well-educated and usually Harvard-educated men to create this elite, super smart think tank to help him run the country. And then he'd have his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who did not fit in with these guys at all. Or at least he certainly came from a different background and he certainly had a different way of looking at things. Now, of this group of the presidential candidate, uh, the, the presidential cabinet that later that historians would later call the best and the brightest, there's one that I just want to draw your attention to now. His name was Robert S. McNamara. McNamara was a World War II veteran. He served as an assistant to Curtis LeMay during the firebombing of Japan. He later on became the CEO of the Ford Motor Company. And that's actually what he was doing in 1960 when Kennedy tapped him to say, hey, I want you to be my Secretary of Defense. Robert McNamara felt like he wasn't cut out for the job, but Kennedy somehow persuaded him to do it. So McNamara quit his job as being the head of the Ford Motor Company and moves into his new office at the Pentagon where he'll be the Secretary of Defense. I bring up uh, McNamara because he will play an important role during the Vietnam War era. He's one of the longest acting Secretary De Secretaries of Defense in American history. He was Secretary of Defense uh, during the Kennedy administration, then during the Johnson administration. Johnson will effectively fire McNamara during the Vietnam War, although it's kind of shady how that goes down. But I just, at this point in time, want to bring up Robert McNamara's name. He will play an important role during the conflicts that, uh, that, that John F. Kennedy experiences as president, especially during the Bay of Pigs crisis, and then really especially during the, uh, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis that we're going to learn about. But McNamara becomes very important during American history during the Vietnam War years. All right. So the 1950s are over, and the long and distinguished career of Dwight Eisenhower is also over. It's interesting what President Eisenhower said in his farewell address. Here is this former military commander, the supreme allied commander in Europe during World War II, the two-term Republican president throughout most of the 1950s. He's a general, he's a Republican, he's a conservative, and he gave a very interesting speech for such a man with such a background on the day before he leaves office. Eisenhower's farewell address was broadcast on live TV around the nation on January the 17th, 1961. Let's look at what he said. Eisenhower cautioned Americans. He said something bad is happening in the American government. And here's what he said. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Every gun that is made, every warship that is launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. All right, so I highlight here this phrase that Eisenhower uses and becomes famous after he uses it. The military-industrial complex. He referred to the United States federal government as the military-industrial complex. By this meaning, the military has grown too big and too influential. And he criticizes the military because of that. Interesting words coming from the former Supreme Allied Commander. But then look what he says in the second paragraph. In, in the second paragraph, he says, Every gun that's made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, 
This signifies a theft from those who are hung, who hunger and are not fed, and those who are cold and are not clothed. In other words, the military is taking too much of the uh, too much government money. Too much federal money is being spent on the military, and we should be redirecting funds to other things. Domestic programs. Let's feed more Americans. There are Americans living in poverty. They're hungry. They are not clothed, or at least are not clothed properly. And we need to be giving more to those who are living in poverty. Interesting that this is what Eisenhower says. Certainly does not does not sound like a traditional conservative Republican and former Supreme Allied commander. These sound like words that would more likely come from a liberal Democrat. We need to stop spending so much on the military and start spending more federal money on domestic programs and welfare relief programs. All right, so Eisenhower's farewell address. And I was slightly incorrect in what I said before. Uh, he did not deliver this the day, the last day he was in office. Uh, he had three more days in office. Uh, he delivered the speech on January the 17th, 1961. It was three days later, on January the 20th, 1961, that John F. Kennedy was sworn into office. And he delivered probably one of the most famous inaugural addresses in American history. So of this famous inaugural address, I want to focus on two parts of it. The speech as a whole was approximately 15 minutes long. Near the beginning of the speech, we have this first quote that I have in which John F. Kennedy said that we're going to let every nation know that we will pay any price and bear any burden to fight for liberty. Okay, we're willing to pay any price and bear any burden to fight for liberty. Okay, so here's what he's referring to. It's the time of the Cold War. Communism is spreading around the world. Kennedy says at the very first part of the speech that a torch has been passed to a new generation and that this new generation is going to fight to preserve liberty around the world. So here he is, sort of expressing the same values, the same ethos as, the, as he did as a young man writing Why England Slept that we Americans are not going to be appeasers. We are going to fight for liberty any, anywhere in the world. Okay. Those words, which were met with a great deal of enthusiasm in 1961, will come back to haunt the Kennedy administration because by the time we reach the end of the decade, the United States of America is embroiled in a highly controversial, very unpopular war, the Vietnam War. And we were there in Vietnam fighting for these values of paying any price, bearing any burden for the success of liberty. By the end of the decade, many people were questioning those values. Is it worth it to pay any price and bear any burden to fight for liberty anywhere in the world? So there's that part of the speech. And then near the end of the speech, he says to this new young generation of Americans that he was mostly addressing in this speech, to whom the torch has been passed he speaks to them and inspires this new generation, really the baby boomers, when he says famously, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Summoning the younger generation to step up and to think collectively. What can we do to improve the United States of America? And that last little bit there just becomes a defining element of the Sort of the older batch of the of, of the baby boomers, those that would have been born in the 1940s and probably very inspired by the words of John F. Kennedy. All right, so let me take a breath here and uh, let's listen to John F. Kennedy delivering this speech. And I've edited this so we get just these two paragraphs. It's nice to listen to John F. Kennedy speak and hear his Boston accent. All right, here we go. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. All right, 
right, so let's begin. The Kennedy administration is on. The torch has been passed to a new generation, a generation that's going to ask what they can do for their country, a generation that's going to pay any price and bear any burden. What's Kennedy going to do? Among the first things that he does in 1961 is begin providing a great deal of funding into the United States Special Forces, otherwise known as the Green Berets, an elite and mostly secretive group of commandos that can be anywhere in the world within 24 hours to complete a military operation. So if there's somebody or some group that needs to be rescued someplace in the world, or if there's somebody who needs to be assassinated somewhere in the world, the Green Berets can be called upon to do the job within 24 hours. The Green Berets will be among the first Americans in South Vietnam to help train the soldiers of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or the Arvin, to protect South Vietnam from their communist North Vietnamese aggressors. So providing a great deal of money to the Green Berets was one of the first things that John F. Kennedy did. Now, just some Cold War terminology here for you. These are terms that most people don't use anymore today. They are specifically tied to the Cold War era, although you still sometimes hear this from time to time. So during the Cold War era, people would refer to the First World and the Third World and sometimes, but not as frequently, the second world. Okay, so what does this mean? The first world, the second world, and the third world. So in the United States, people would refer to countries that were democratic and economically developed as the first world. So this would be the United States of America, Western Europe, mostly those countries. And by the way, it's in those countries that would use these terms, first world, second world, third world. Go figure, the democratic and economically developed countries would refer to them as themselves as number one, so the first world. The second world would be the communist world, so the Soviet Union, China, and now Cuba. And then there's this term, the third world. The third world would be countries that were poor, they were economically undeveloped, and they kind of hovered in between the first world, the democratic countries, and the second world, the communist countries. So Kennedy focused a lot on the third world. And he hints at the Third World in his inauguration address and in a wide variety of other speeches throughout his political career throughout the late 40s and throughout the 1950s. He talks about the importance of the Third World. Now, why is the Third World the economically undeveloped areas in Africa, South America, Southeast Asia? What makes this Third World, the, what we would call today the undeveloped countries, what would make them significantly back during the Cold War. Well, Kennedy knew that the countries that would tend to go communist would be the poor countries. So Cuba would be an excellent example of this. Cuba was mostly poor. The majority of people who lived there were poor. There was a handful of land-owning elites who exploited most of the Cuban population, and so Cuba was ripe for revolution. When the majority of the people are poor and there's a handful of wealthy elites, Go figure, most of the poor people would have a desire for a communist revolution. So Kennedy decides to focus a great deal of, of American energy and uh, money on the third world. Okay, so hopefully these terms, first world, second world, third world, they all make sense. Again, we don't use them anymore, but occasionally I'll still hear, hear people use the term third world, even though that's a, a Cold War era term. When they, if, if somebody says the third world, they're talking about undeve economically undeveloped countries. All right, so Kennedy's big idea is we need to look at the third world and we need to make them our friend. We need to do things for them. We need to take care of them. That way, the poor people of those countries don't tilt towards a communist revolution. And one of the ways Kennedy did this, one of the ways in which he made friends with these economically undeveloped countries, the third world, was through creating an, a, an organization through executive order called the Peace Corps. John F. Kennedy established the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps is still around today, and here is what the Peace Corps is. The Peace Corps is aimed at mostly young adult Americans. You have to be college educated to go into the Peace Corps, so probably no younger than age 22. Now, any adult with a college education can apply to be in the Peace Corps, but really, for the most part, You've got to be young, highly energetic, intelligent, and physically fit to go into the Peace Corps. Okay, so 
In defining the Peace Corps, I think I'm going to describe the process of getting into the Peace Corps and then what the Peace Corps does to you if you get into it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, so if I wanted to join the Peace Corps, I must be, I must have a college education and then I can apply to the Peace Corps. It is a very selective organization. The Peace Corps rejects far more applications than it accepts. Okay, but let's say I get accepted into the Peace Corps. If I get accepted in the Peace Corps, then I commit to two years of voluntary service for the United States government to place me anywhere in the world to learn the language of that country, to take whatever job the government gives me to do in that country, and to live alone in my own home and not with any other Americans so that I can be integrated into the community of wherever it is I am placed. Okay, so that's the Peace Corps. All right, so hopefully this is starting to make sense. Let me go over that again, and let me just kind of make up a fake scenario here talking about the Peace Corps. All right, so let's say I apply to the Peace Corps. I'm a 22-year-old young man. I'm just pretending for real here now. I graduate from college, and let's say I've got a college degree in, I don't know, business. You know, I want to go into finance as a career, but I'm 22 years old. I'm not really ready to just, you know, go work for a company yet. And I'm feeling like I want to do some good for the world. I'm young, I'm energetic, I'm not really to, 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 to sit at a desk yet uh, and do a job like that. So, hey, I'll apply for the apply to the Peace Corps. So I apply to the Peace Corps and I get accepted. All right, so I go to the Peace Corps, I report to the Peace Corps in the same way that I would report to the military. And they say, okay, you are now going to go and live for the next two years in a small town in Nicaragua in Central America. Now, in Nicaragua, they speak Spanish, but I don't have any background in Spanish. Let's say I've spent, uh, I, I did my foreign language in German when I was in high school and in college. I don't speak any English or any, any Spanish. I speak English and German. Uh, the Peace Corps will do a one-month intensive foreign language training in which they will teach you a foreign language over the course of several weeks from sunup to sundown so that you are learning a foreign language. You're essentially getting drilled in this language so that you are as fluent as possible, as quickly as possible. And then they send me down to Nicaragua where my job is to work construction, building hospitals with other Nicaraguans with money and material that have been provided by the United States government in small rural villages in Nicaragua. And I think, well, I don't have any background in Spanish. I don't have any background in building medical facilities. But if the United States government and the Peace Corps say, that's what you're doing, then you go and you do it. I go down there. I moved into a small little house and wherever I'm placed, there will be no other Americans around there so that I am there living in the community, speaking the language of the people who live there, doing good for the people who live there. And I do that for two years. When I'm done, I get a small stipend for having completed my two years of service in the Peace Corps. And I think that today it's something like $5,000, but you can check me on that. But you do that, you collect this small stipend, and you can feel really good that as a young adult, you went off into the world and you served the community of some people somewhere in the third world. The Peace Corps was designed to appeal to young adult Americans who were idealistic, who are enthusiastic, who are energetic, and who would be willing to do something like this. It was a daring and bold thing to do. It was also for people who weren't interested in the military as a way of serving your country. So instead of getting out of college and going into the military to serve your country that way, somewhere off in the world, you could join the Peace Corps and go and do something good for people in need anywhere in the world. That was the Peace Corps. And that is still the Peace Corps today. But placing the Peace Corps within the context of the Cold War in which it developed, this was a way, you know, there's two ways to think about the Peace Corps. Think about it, 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 think about it from the perspective of the mostly young adults that joined it, which is what I've been talking about so far. You know, it's a very exciting thing. It makes you feel good about doing something good. You got to be adventurous. You have to be tough. I mean, it's tough to go and live somewhere else and in the world in someplace very different likely than where you came from in the United States of America. You have to go live in poverty. 
or, or at least in impoverished areas of the world, and you have to integrate yourself into the community. That's pretty exciting and daring and bold and noble work. And that appeals to a, lot, to, to a certain group of young people. So there's that element of the Peace Corps. And as you hear this and you're like, wow, that sounds kind of cool. I'd like to do it. You too can join the Peace Corps someday. It is still around. Okay, so there's that way of looking at the Peace Corps. But then let's look at it from a political and diplomatic perspective during the Cold War. We, the United States of America, are sending all of these young people to go into poor communities to help them build schools, build hospitals, provide education, sometimes provide business consultation to help them develop businesses. If we do that, then these countries in the third world will like the United States of America. They will like our country. They'll be grateful and thankful for what we're doing. And they'll tip away from communism and towards American democracy. So hopefully those two ways of looking at the Peace Corps make sense. There's how it excites certain Americans for whom this lifestyle would appeal, but then there's this political, diplomatic way of looking at the Peace Corps that the Peace Corps was a way of fighting communism around the world. All right, so we're into Kennedy's first year as president. He's providing significant financing for the Green Berets, and he's created the Peace Corps. And three years into his administration, Kennedy decides to make a very bold, brazen, anti-communist move against Cuba. So as soon as Fidel Castro took over Cuba in 1959 and made that country communist, plans developed secretively in the United States government to remove Fidel Castro from power and even to have him assassinated. In the year 1960, when Eisenhower was still president, a more elaborate plan was hatched to create a counter-revolution in Cuba and to have Fidel Castro removed from power. It was to work like this. After the 1959 Cuban Revolution, there was a significant number of Cuban exiles, individuals who had fled Cuba because they did not want to live under the Castro communist regime. And many of these people came to the United States of America. In 1960, the CIA helped to develop a plan to create a counter-revolution against Castro in Cuba involving these Cuban exiles. And the plan was to work like this. The American CIA would train some of these Cuban exiles to prepare them for a counter-invasion. They would provide them with training, guns and other military equipment, as well as American bombers that would be painted to look like they were old Cuban planes all in preparation for an invasion of Cuba. The Cuban exiles in preparation for the invasion would be shipped out of the United States of America into Central America. And from Central America, they would invade Cuba by both sea and air. This would be known as the Bay of Pigs in, uh, I'm sorry, the Bay of Pigs invasion because the initial landings was, were, were to be in an area on the southern part of Cuba called the Bay of Pigs. Now in Cuba, it's not actually called the Bay of Pigs. It's called, and pardon me because I don't speak Spanish here, Bahia de Cochinos, which translates into Bay of Pigs. But this is the big plan. It never happened during the Eisenhower administration. So when Kennedy comes to power in 1961, the CIA presents to him this plan, which had been developed in secret. So Kennedy is told all of these Cuban exiles have been trained they're getting prepared. It'll be, they'll be ready to go. And the CIA tells Kennedy, we can do this. Kennedy expresses some doubts. How are the Cubans not going to know? How is Fidel's Castro government not going to know that we're behind this? This seems like an obvious thing that the United States would do. Would it really happen that these Cuban exiles would be all together in Central America planning this massive invasion without our help? It just doesn't seem likely. But the CIA and the military were able to convince Kennedy it won't fail. It's going to be secretive. The Cubans, or at least Castro, aren't going to know that this is happening until it's too late. So all this is going on in secret, and the men that are being sent in are well-trained. They will be successful. Castro doesn't stand a chance. Kennedy has to make the decision, does he sign off on this? And in the end, reluctantly, he does. 
He believed in the CIA and the high-level brass military officials who were telling him that this will happen in secret and it will not fail. We will recapture Cuba and make it once again a non-communist country. So on April the 17th, 1961, the Bay of Pigs invasion begins and it is a dismal failure. One way to think about this operation was like this. So the CIA had promised Kennedy that it was going to be secretive and it was going to be successful. But later on, historians said this operation was too big to be secretive and it was too small to be successful. So as the military force was being developed in uh, Central America and specifically in the country of Nicaragua, that news was spread to Castro fairly quickly. There is a large military operation that's developing in Central America. <laughs> there are American B-27 bombers that are being painted to look like Cuban bombers. And Castro said, uh-huh, okay, let's start preparing Cuba for an invasion. So when the American planes were flying over Cuba to bomb Cuban airfields, Ca Castro had moved his air force into a hidden secret location so we didn't know where to bomb, or rather the exiles uh, who were flying the plane didn't know where to bomb. Uh, the sea invasion, the amphibious invasion that was actually going into the Bay of Pigs, the boats got stuck on reefs out at sea, so they didn't even make it ashore, and they were easily captured. Paratroopers who, who parachuted down into the country were immediately surrounded and captured, which is what you see here. It was a debacle, and it will ultimately be really embarrassing for the United States of America. Um, when this was going on and Kennedy was informed that this mission was not successful, he had to make a decision. Uh, do we send in the United States military to support these exiles, or do we just let them be captured? They thought these individuals that you see here, these men that you see here being captured and marched off to prison, they really believed that they had the full backing and support of the United States of America and that they would be helped by the United States. But if you're Kennedy, what do you do? Well, Kennedy made the decision that he was not going to support them. He was not going to send in the U.S. military after the failure of this operation, because to do to do so would be to engage in an act of war against Cuba. Cuba would call upon the Soviet Union and it might initiate World War III. So Kennedy does not send in the military, the United States military, to support the Cuban exiles after they had failed to recapture Cuba. All right. This botched mission, which was a clear act of aggression on the part of the United States of America toward Cuba in an attempt to remove Fidel Castro from power, naturally brought Fidel Castro closer to Nikita Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. The United States was clearly a threat to Cuba, so Castro goes to the Soviet Union and says, can I get your support? Can I get your help? Nikita Khrushchev agrees, and Nikita Khrushchev will agree to begin, and this becomes important, Nikita Khrushchev agrees to begin sending defensive military supplies to Cuba. So things like anti-aircraft gun, machine guns, defensive missiles, all of these things to help protect Cuba. Now, when Khrushchev starts doing this, he is asked to make an agreement with the United States of America in the United Nations that the Soviet Union will only provide defensive war material to Cuba. So in other words, military technology to protect the country and not aggressive military equipment that they could use to attack the United States of America. And that becomes important. The United States of America says, okay, you are allowed to send in stuff to Cuba to help Cuba defend itself because that's within a nation's right to protect itself. But you must agree that you're not going to send offensive missiles into Cuba that you could use to attack the United States of America. Khrushchev and the Soviet government agree to this. Yes, we're only going to send defensive military equipment into, into Cuba. So defensive missiles, anti-aircraft guns, stuff like that. All right, and that's an important agreement to know about because it sort of sets up our next conflict that we're going to have with Cuba and the Soviets and Castro. The other outcome of the, of the Bay of Pigs debacle is this happened really early on in the Kennedy administration. You'd only be president for about three months. And Kennedy had to decide how to respond to this. The Ameri United States of America was humiliated by this. Here's what Kennedy did. He went on national television and he accepted responsibility for the defeat. 
He accepted responsibility. Now, here's what's interesting to think about. The United States of America does something that ends up being this big mess, and we, we, we're humiliated by it. The president goes on television and says, I accept responsibility. It was, it's my fault. How do you think the people of the United States of America would respond to a president who did that? Would his popularity go up or would his popularity go down? Interestingly, after Kennedy accepted responsibility for the Bay of Pigs fiasco, his popularity went up. It went up. People respected him more. He could have said this was the fault of the CIA. He could have cast blame elsewhere. This is sort of our natural human inclination when things go wrong is to not accept responsibility. But I think this is a nice thing to learn that when you do accept responsibility for a screw up, it actually makes people respect you more. It's a good lesson from history to learn. Another response to the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Here is John F. Kennedy with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the commanders of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard, the top brass officials who had assured Kennedy this Bay of Pigs invasion should work. And it didn't. If you're John F. Kennedy, are you going to trust these guys as much anymore? Of course not. Had Kennedy listened to his conscience and thought, mm, this doesn't sound as good as you guys are making it, he wouldn't have been so quick to sign off on the Bay of Pigs invasion. So as a result of the Bay of Pigs not being a success, John Kennedy starts to question these men and their confidence in the United States military capacity. And whereas Kennedy starts to take a step back from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he does start to rely more on his younger brother, the Attorney General Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy had also been highly suspicious that the Bay of Pigs plan wouldn't go as smoothly as our top military commanders had suggested. So John F. Kennedy begins to lean in on his little brother a little bit more. So when it comes to future conflicts in which we may have to use our military, President Kennedy will rely upon the man who he knows has his back and cares about him, his younger brother, Bobby. Now, the Bay of Pigs fiasco, which humiliated the United States of America, was a wonderful thing for Nikita Khrushchev and the Soviet Union because the United States of America seems to be bumbling and weak under the leadership of its new young president. So now is Khrushchev's opportunity. Now is when he can strike while the iron is hot. And so he begins making his bold moves. Several months later, per Khrushchev's order, the Berlin Wall is constructed in August of 1961. This construction event happens nearly overnight. Around the city of Berlin, a cement wall is constructed. There's actually two walls. There's an interior wall along the border of West Berlin. And then there's a no man's land. And then there's a second wall that goes around the first wall. A series of guard towers are set up along the Berlin Wall where the East German State Security, or the Stasi, can be stationed with orders to shoot to kill anybody who tries to go from East Berlin to West Berlin. Now, why did Nikita Khrushchev have the Berlin Wall built? Well, in part he built it to stop people from going from East Berlin to West Berlin and then defecting to the West. In particular, there was... Uh, in Eastern Europe, throughout the communist bloc, something going on that we identify as a brain drain. And so here's what we mean by a brain drain. Highly educated people, the brains, were leaving the East for the West, hence the drain. And it makes sense why this was happening. In communist countries like the Soviet Union, like East Germany, you could receive a free education, which sounds pretty nice. Now, education was extraordinarily competitive in the communist world. So if you wanted to become a doctor, you could get your medical degree for free, but you had to be really smart because it was highly competitive to become a medical doctor. So you have to go through the primary and secondary schooling. You have to be accepted into the university. You have to perform really well and at the university level. And then you apply to medical school and you must get accepted there. And so long as you're smart enough and you're talented enough, you can move up to get that degree. Okay, but when, then when you have it, sounds really good. You're a medical doctor now. 
But this is the communist world in which medical doctors get paid the exact same salary, at least ideally they get paid the exact same salary, as everybody else in society. I mean, that's kind of the communist ideal, that everybody should be equal. Now, let's say you've become a medical doctor and you're living in the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, and you're doing what you love to do, you're a medical doctor, but <laughs> you know that if you could only go to the West, you could go to West Germany, you could go to France, you could go to Britain, you could go to the United States. As a medical doctor, you get paid a lot of money live in a nice home, drive a really nice car. There is very much an appeal to that, obviously. And so people like highly educated engineers, doctors, they just left. They went to the West and defected. And the easiest place to do that was West Berlin. So Khrushchev built a wall around West Berlin, stopping people from going from one side to another. The Berlin Wall will become perhaps the most notable symbol of the Cold War and the metaphorical Iron Curtain. For us in the United States of America and throughout the Western world, it was a symbol of the oppressive dictatorship of the Soviet Union and the communist world. But Nikita Khrushchev, he wanted to see a world in which the Berlin Wall didn't exist because he doesn't want West Berlin to exist. He wants West Berlin to be part of East Germany. He wants there to be one Berlin, a communist Berlin. So the following year, in 1962, Nikita Khrushchev, in order to set things straight with the Politburo and show them that he is the greatest Soviet premier they could ever hope for, he's going to make a bold move to capture West Berlin. His plan was going to go into effect in 1962, and here's what that plan was. One. So the Soviet Union is already sending weapons into Cuba. The Soviet Union is now going to start secretively sending nuclear missiles into Cuba. Now, this is in violation of the agreement that the Soviet Union made with the United States of America that they would only send defensive war materials to Cuba. But how is the United States going to know? The shipments are, are, are all going over there already. How are the Americans really going to know that in some of that, on some of those boats going from the Soviet Union to Cuba, there's going to be offensive nuclear missiles? Khrushchev is confident that the United States will never find out about this. So, the Soviet Union constructs nuclear missiles in Cuba, points them at the United States of America, and activates them. In other words, they're ready to go. They're ready to be fired. So. Part one of his plan is to secretively place nuclear missiles in Cuba. All right, part two of his plan. Once those missiles are active, they're ready to go. Inform the United States of America that there are nuclear weapons in Cuba that the, that the Soviet Union is no longer going to stand for, the aggressive actions of the United States of America, and that at any point of time, the Soviet Union can launch an attack against the United States of America and destroy the United States of America within 15 minutes. So in other words, once you got a gun pointed to your enemy's head, there's really nothing your enemy can do against you because if they try anything, you shoot them dead. And that's what Khrushchev wanted to do to the United States of America. They wanted to put our back against the wall. Khrushchev wanted to put our back against the wall with these nuclear missiles so that we would back down from any type of aggressive action. Okay. So, step two, once the missiles are active, threaten the USA with a nuclear attack. All right. And then the third thing. Khrushchev suspects that the United States of America will try to engage in some sort of diplomatic action to get those nuclear missiles out of Cuba and back to the Soviet Union. Khrushchev will then use that American request to remove the missiles as a bargaining chip for saying, okay, I'll take the missiles out. But I want West Berlin. And so at the end of all this, Khrushchev says, we get the missiles back out of Cuba. We go to the way things were before. But West Berlin becomes a communist city. It becomes part of East Germany. And Khrushchev goes down in history as one of the greatest Soviet dictators. So that was his plan. Did it work? In October of 1962, 
a U-2 spy plane flying over Cuba took pictures. That's what U-2 spy planes do. Upon landing back in the United States, those pictures were transferred to the Pentagon for analysis. The first experts that looked at the photograph suspected that there were nuclear missiles being constructed in Cuba. These pictures naturally were then inspected by other experts, and they concluded unequivocally that these were aggressive nuclear missiles that were being constructed in Cuba. President Kennedy was quickly informed. President Kennedy wanted to know, are these missiles operational yet? In other words, can they be fired? He was told, no, based upon our photographs, they were not operational yet, but they would be within a matter of days, and that he needed to act fast. Because once operational, these missiles would be within striking distance of nearly every major city in the continental United States, with the exception of the Pacific Northwest. The missiles couldn't reach Seattle and Portland. Another way of thinking of this, once operational, the Soviets would have the ability to kill 20 million Americans within approximately 15 minutes. Thus begins the Cuban Missile Crisis, which will last for 13 days in October of 1962. It was a showdown between Nikita Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy. Kennedy wants the missiles out of Cuba. Nikita Khrushchev is not going to take any missiles out of Cuba unless the United States concedes something. One of the things, by the way, that the United States could concede was taking our aggressive nuclear missiles out of the country of Turkey. The country of Turkey is located partially in Europe, partially in the Middle East, in Asia Minor. They are an ally of the United States of America. And we had, for a long time, had nuclear missiles there. And the distance between Turkey and the Soviet Union is pretty much equivalent to the distance between Cuba and the United States of America. So it's very comparable. Now, the missiles that we had there were old and largely unoperational, but Kennedy doesn't want to take our missiles out of Turkey because it would be seen as a sign of weakness of the United States of America, and that might embolden the Soviets to make more requests for what we should do. So things start heating up. Kennedy did decide to inform the people of the United States of America on live national television that this situation existed. And there was a great deal of fear here in the United States, as well as around the world, once this becomes public, that we're headed straight to World War III, and World War III will be a nuclear war. Now, John F. Kennedy, surrounded by these guys, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as many other political and military advisors, he's getting input from all of them in terms of how he should handle this situation. Now, he's the President of the United States. Ultimately, the decision is his but he certainly wants and needs their advice at this time. Most of the advice he's getting is this. We need to do an airstrike on Cuba. We need to send our planes over Cuba, and we need to strike at those missile sites where those missiles are being constructed. We need to do it. We need to do it now. We need to do it before they become operational, because once, we, once they become operational, we can no longer strike, strike them. So why hesitate? Mr. President, give us the order. We'll send in our, our fighter planes. They will strike down these missile sites. Mr. President, do it. You have to do it. Do it now. Don't hesitate a second longer. All right, so Kennedy's in this situation. And it's one of these moments where I encourage you to think, if you were John F. Kennedy, if you were in his shoes, what would you do? All these military commanders are saying, this is exactly what you have to do, and we have to do it now. And almost unanimously, this is what they're telling you. So would you just say, okay, military, really smart military guys, this is your area of expertise. If you say we can do this, then, then, then let's do it. Would you do that, or would you try to take a step back and think about this, and think about the ramifications of just doing an airstrike against Cuba? And here's where probably the Bay of Pigs debacle actually helped John F. Kennedy, because he learned not just to trust these guys, that they are human and they screw up too. And he also was very well aware of if he strikes Cuba, that's an act of war. Cuba is allied with the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union might attack the United States of America, and we're in the middle of World War III. John F. Kennedy waits, and he thinks about the situation. 
Also, if you remember, John F. Kennedy was a voracious reader, reading two to three books a week, even while he was president of the United States of America. This was going on in October of 1962. In the summer of 1962, he read a book that had just been released by the amateur American historian Barbara Tuckman called The Guns of August, which was about why World War I began. Now, this is a book that you should be familiar with because you learned about this book when we studied the First World War. And let's review what you learned at that time. According to Barbara Tuckman, the First World War happened because the following three things occurred. And the following three things are the lessons of the First World War and how we can learn how to stop another catastrophic world war from happening. Let's review the lessons of Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. First, in the summer of 1914, there was an atmosphere of fear among the major countries of Europe. They all thought that they were in a situation where they were going to be attacked by an enemy. The first situation that led to the start of World War I, there was an atmosphere of fear. Two, all of the major countries that got involved in the First World War all had an incredible confidence in their military. They all felt that their military was the superior military that they couldn't lose. Three, the political leaders had confidence in their military commanders, and so they listened to their military commanders without questioning them. Therefore, they relinquished control to the military leaders. The military leaders said, we strike, and once those orders go out, they cannot be rescinded. Everybody attacks each other, and the war begins. As Barbara Tuckman says, once the stone begins to roll, you cannot stop it. John F. Kennedy read this book in the summer of 1962 and was remembering it a couple months later in October. And this is one of the very few times in history that we actually learned the lessons of history and applied it and, and applied those lessons to stop another major catastrophe from happening. And I'm saying we, one man, John F. Kennedy, he felt that the situation in October of 1962 was the same as the situation in the summer of 1914. Was there an atmosphere of fear? Heck yeah, there is an atmosphere of fear. The Soviets are constructing nuclear missiles in Cuba. Two, is there confidence in the military? Well, the military in the United States sure has confidence. We can go in, we can strike Cuba. Please, you need to do this, you need to do this now. The question was then, was Kennedy going to relinquish control to the military leaders? Kennedy knew if he did that, he would probably start World War III. So he held back and he refused. He refused to allow those airstrikes to happen. The military at the time, the military commanders that were consulting Kennedy on all this, they thought Kennedy was nuts. They thought he was weak. And he, they thought that he didn't care about the United States of America, that he was unwilling to go in and do this airstrike, making the Americans very vulnerable and subject to attack. But from Kennedy's perspective, he thought by acting tough and acting aggressively, this would force a Soviet retaliation and Americans really would get killed. So what does Kennedy do? Well, he made a series of moves. The first was he issued a statement to the world and to the Soviet Union that the United States would be and let me speak, choosing my words very precisely here, the United States would be placing Cuba under quarantine. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that the United States is going to send its Navy out into the Caribbean, and we are going to essentially patrol around Cuba, stopping any naval traffic happening to or from Cuba. So in other words, no boats are allowed to come and go from Cuba including any Soviet vessels that would be bringing in anything into Cuba. Now, Kennedy chose this word quarantine with an intended purpose. When you say something is being quarantined, that means you are protecting it. The word he didn't use was blockade. And really what we are doing in practice is a blockade. You're surrounding another country and you're stopping any traffic from going in and out of the country. That's a blockade. But the Kennedy administration used the word quarantine because the word blockade denotes an act of war. 
So it was really a matter of semantics. It was a word choice. The blockade was initiated. The Soviet ships came and they were trying to go through the blockade. And this was sort of the showdown moment. Would the Soviet ships try to run the blockade slash quarantine of Cuba? And so there were situations like what you see in the picture here with the American ship on the right, the Soviet transport vehicle or transport boat, the cargo boat on the left, and the ships met each other and they sailed in parallel next to each other. And this was a tense moment. And there were several moments like this during the, during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and the blockade slash quarantine of Cuba. If this Soviet boat decides to turn and go in toward Cuba, the American destroyer would have to fire upon it. And by firing upon it, the Soviet ship would most likely retaliate and fire upon the American vessel, and the Soviets and the Americans go to war. Now, the American boats and the Soviet boats, they would be, in a certain way, communicating with each other. Because the American boats would signal, you're not allowed to cross over into these waters, and the Americans would signal to the Soviet boats with flares and star shells, and even by firing a torpedo in front of the boat, the Soviet cargo boat. So there was some aggressive signaling that was going on that certainly created some tension. And then there was a Soviet submarine. Now the question was, is the submarine, is the Soviet submarine going to break the blockade slash quarantine and go under the American destroyers? And if that happened, what, how would the Americans respond to the submarine? Well, what the Americans tried to do was to bring the submarine up to get it to surface. And to do that, the Americans dropped something called depth charges. These explosive things in the water to signal to the submarine to get up to surface. And when the Americans dropped the depth charges, the commanders on the submarine, they read that as an attack against the sub. And the submarine commanders began the process of preparing to fire nuclear missiles at the United States of America because this was a this was a, a nuclear submarine and it had the capacity to fire a nuclear missile from the submarine to the United States of America and the submarine was preparing to do this but one of the commanders of the submarine refused to initiate the launch and here is this particular individual Vasily Arkhipov this particular individual who is largely unknown to history is a man who likely stopped World War III from happening. The other commanders of the submarine were willing to launch a nuclear missile at the United States of America. Vasily Arkhipov said, no, I refuse to do this. So Vice Admiral Arkhipov, who died in the year 1998, I say, thank you very much. We're alive and here today because you decided to listen to your conscience and not launch nuclear missiles at the United States of America. This particular event, the Cuban Missile Crisis, lasted for 13 days, and that term 13 days has stuck because Bobby Kennedy wrote a book about it called 13 Days, and these were 13 tense days in which the United States of America and the Soviet Union were in this showdown because somebody had to give in. Either the United States of America gives in and allows the Soviets to put these nuclear missiles into Cuba and to allow them to become operational, and we back down, or Nikita Khrushchev and the Soviet Union backs down and they remove their missiles out of, out of Cuba. Either way, somebody's getting humiliated. The Cuban Missile Crisis was, so far as we know, the closest the world has ever come to nuclear war. And it was very close. I mean, just like you just learned. Had Vasily Arkhipov not said, no, I refuse to do this, we would have had a nuclear war. And there were several moments like that during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But in the end, peace prevailed. And this was largely because of Kennedy's really thoughtful approach to this crisis. A lot of people consider this to be John Kennedy's finest hour as president of the United States. So how did he do it? So in order to end the Cuban Missile Crisis peacefully, the first thing Kennedy did was focus on diplomacy. He did not resort to quick military action. He kept trying to find a way to talk with the Soviets and to negotiate a peace that would work for everybody. And that was difficult to do because it's not like he could pick up a phone and call Nikita Khrushchev in the, in the Kremlin and Moscow and work out a deal with them. 
Now, coincidentally, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, a phone will be placed in the White House and in the Kremlin to do just that, to enable a conversation between the Soviet Union and the United States so that they could potentially avoid a war in a future situation like this. He did make the bold move to blockade Cuba, but called a quarantine, and that worked. The ships, the Soviet ships, never tried to run the blockade line. And then Kennedy constantly tried to think about what Khrushchev was thinking, and Kennedy refused to make a move during the Cuban Missile Crisis without thinking, okay, if I do this, how will Khrushchev be forced to respond? So he sort of, Kennedy was sort of thinking like a master chess player, always thinking, okay, if I move my piece here, what will my opponent do? And how will my opponent be forced to respond to this? We know a lot about Kennedy's thinking at this time because all of the conversations that were going on in the White House, even the top secret conversations, were being recorded and historians have access to those tapes. And it's interesting because Kennedy would talk aloud about his thinking process. So he said, would say, okay, if, if we do this or if I do this, then what will Khrushchev do? Well, he might do this or he might do that. He's working through what the Soviet response is always going to be. And throughout doing all this, he assumed that Khrushchev didn't want a nuclear war as well. So as aggressive as the Soviets were being, and as much as uh, his, the American military commanders are saying, we need to strike, we need to do something aggressive, because Khrushchev is mean and evil. <laughs> they didn't necessarily say he was mean and evil, but they did say that the Soviets are very aggressive, and aggression is the only language that they know. Kennedy refused to take the bait for, with all that, and he always kept in mind that Khrushchev didn't want nuclear war either, but that he had to find a way to allow Khrushchev to have a victory too. In the end, what John F. Kennedy was able to do after the successful blockade of Cuba, in which there are still nuclear missiles in, in, in Cuba, was this. John Kennedy knew that his younger brother, Bobby Kennedy, knew of a Soviet spy who was living and operating in Washington, D.C. That spy was contacted, and the spy was expected to relay to Khrushchev that the United States was willing to strike a deal. And the deal was this, that if Nikita Khrushchev had the missiles in Cuba dismantled and sent back to the Soviet Union, then the United States of America would remove its missiles from Turkey. That was the deal. Now, there were certain conditions and elements to this deal, namely that Nikita Khrushchev was allowed to tell people in the Politburo that the United States had agreed to take its missiles out of Cuba or, or out of Turkey, and therefore this was therefore a success for him and for the Soviet Union, but he was not allowed to go public with this, no, not public beyond the Politburo, because Kennedy could not be seen as making a compromise with Khrushchev to the American people, and in particular, in, in particular, the military leaders of the United States. But this was the deal, and this deal worked. Khrushchev removed the missiles from Cuba. Kennedy was able to boast, I won the Cuban Missile Crisis. Nikita Khrushchev was able to go to the Soviet leadership and say, this plan worked, and that it forced the United States of America to take their old nuclear missiles out of Turkey. I won the, new, the Cuban Missile Crisis. This was probably the best possible outcome of this horrible, truly scary, frightening event in which the world was on the brink of nuclear war. It was really a victory for the entire world. And that's why many people consider this, the Cuban Missile Crisis, to be John F. Kennedy's finest hour. The following year of 1963, John F. Kennedy went to the Berlin Wall. He gave a speech to the people of West Berlin, proclaiming that the American people would always support them, that the American people would never let them down, that the American people would make sure that the West Berliners would always be free. And at the finale of this speech, John F. Kennedy wanted to tell the people of West Berlin that he too was a Berliner. And this was to show the people of West Berlin how much he supported them. He wanted to say, I am one of you. 
So John F. Kennedy, in his speech, decided to proclaim, not in English, but in German, I am a Berliner. And so he directly translated the phrase, I am a Berliner, from English into German, which was, Ich bin ein Berliner. Now, funny thing about the translation, and it's also why you should never directly translate something, you should be familiar with the nuances of the language that you are trying to speak. In German, if you want to say that you are a person from a particular area, you do not use the indefinite article. So you, in, in English, we would say, I am a Berliner, or you know, I am an Ohioan, or I am an American. But in German, you don't do that. You don't use the indefinite article. So in English, you would say, if you wanted to say, I am an Ohioan, you would just simply say, I am Ohioan, or I am American. You don't use the indefinite article, the A. And so when John F. Kennedy said this, Ich bin ein Berliner, there were jokes that came out much later on in history that what he had actually said was not I am a Berliner, but rather I am a jelly donut. Because in Germany, there's a particular type of donut that is called a Berliner. And these donuts are jelly-filled, sugar-coated donuts. They're quite delicious. And so the joke was that John F. Kennedy said, I am a jelly donut to a bunch of Germans. And that's kind of funny to think about. However, it is worth noting that in Germany at the time, nobody actually interpreted John F. Kennedy's statement like that because there's no historical evidence of that. If there was some sense that that's what John F. Kennedy said about himself, then he probably would be mocked in, in, in newspapers and such, and, and nobody, nobody interpreted his words like that. Yes, he was speaking a little incorrectly, but everybody pretty much knew what he was trying to say. But John F. Kennedy, <laughs> the point of the trip and the point of the speech was to show that Americans are standing behind the city of West Berlin. Another very important element of the John F. Kennedy administration was catching up to the Soviets in the space race. The Soviets got to outer space first. They put the first human being into outer space first. And we struggled to get rockets off the ground. But in the 1960s, we catch up with the Soviets. We first had our Mercury program, which was designed to get, rather to put an American into outer space. And we finally did it in 1962. The first American goes into outer space. And that first American was John Glenn a native of Cambridge, Ohio. Cambridge is, if you ever want to visit the small town of Cambridge, Ohio, you leave Columbus, you travel 70 east for about an hour. Cambridge is located pretty much in between Columbus, Ohio, and the West Virginia border directly east of Columbus. From that little small town of Cambridge, Ohio came John Glenn. He attended the nearby Muskingum College and then became a fighter pilot and a NASA astronaut. In the year 1962, he was su successfully launched into outer space. He was in outer space for approximately five hours. The space capsule, space capsule that he was in was called Friendship 7, and in the course of five hours, he orbited the Earth four times. And afterwards, he was a national hero. There was a ticker tape parade for him. In the 1970s, he got into politics and he became an Ohio senator. From 1974 to 1999, when he quit politics, he decided to go into outer space again. John Glenn, John Glenn passed away in 2016. There are many things around here in Columbus, Ohio that are named after John Glenn. And probably the biggest thing that's uh, been named after John Glenn since his passing is the Columbus Airport, which is now John Glenn International Airport. So John Glenn was probably the pinnacle of the Mercury program. But after the Mercury program was successful with launching a human being into outer space and bringing him safely home, the next thing that was initiated was the Apollo program, which was to put an American on the moon and bring that American safely home. John Kennedy went to Rice University, which is in Houston, Texas which is also where there is a, well, which is where the headquarters for NASA is in Houston. And John F. Kennedy gave a speech at Rice University in which he said, we choose to go to the moon. And he states that the United States of America will put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. So within the next eight years, before 1970, the United States would land an American on the moon. 
and bring that person safely home. This kicked NASA into high gear to complete a mission that many people in the United States and around the world didn't think was possible and to do it at an extraordinarily fast pace to do this within eight years. It would be a program that many Americans would find highly inspirational. And throughout the turbulence of the 1960s, the space program, the Apollo program, would be one thing that would inspire and bring together Americans as one of the greatest things we could possibly do. In late November of 1963, John F. Kennedy was beginning to set his eyes on re-election and his 1964 campaign. And in November of 1963, John F. Kennedy and the First Lady Jackie Kennedy and Vice President Lyndon Johnson and his spouse, the Second Lady, Lady Bird Johnson, all traveled to Texas. One of the first stops was to San Antonio, Texas, where NASA had some recent develop developments that they wanted to present to President Kennedy to show the president how the Apollo space program was going. The next part of the trip was in Dallas, Texas. John Kennedy was in Dallas, Texas for political reasons. Texas was a big state. It is a big state. It's a populous state. And it was strongly believed that if Kennedy wanted to win re-election in 1964, he needed the electoral votes from the state of Texas. And that Texas, even though it was the home state of Lyndon Johnson, might turn away from supporting John Kennedy. Kennedy was in Texas to rally support and to begin the process of getting Texans to support him in the 1964 presidential campaign, or presidential election rather. When he and the First Lady and their entourage arrived in Dallas on the morning of November the 22nd, 1963, they were immediately ushered into a convertible. Riding in front of them was the governor of Texas, Governor Connolly. As the motorcade advanced through downtown Dallas, they took, they took several turns around an area called Dealey Plaza. They passed a building that was the Texas School Book Depository. Yes, a building that houses textbooks for the state of Texas. And not long after they passed that particular building, three shots rang out from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. The bullets were aimed at the president. The first bullet missed. The second bullet went through the president's neck. The third bullet hit the president in the back of the head, blowing off a piece of his skull and parts of his brain. He collapsed forward in the car. Jackie almost instinctively jumped up, grabbed the parts of her husband's skull that were on the back of the car, pressed them to his head, and laid down on top of him, protecting him in the back of the car. The president was rushed to a hospital but there was absolutely nothing they could do to save him. The president was pronounced dead, the fourth president in American history to be assassinated. The suspect who had fired the three shots fled the scene, but police found him hiding in a movie theater and arrested him. His name was Lee Harvey Oswald. He was a former United States Marine who then read the works of Karl Marx and other communist writers became intrigued with communism and the Soviet Union, and moved to the Soviet Union and lived there for a while. He met a wife in the Soviet Union, but eventually moved back, and they lived together in Dallas, Texas. Lee Harvey Oswald was emotionally unstable, as well as verbally and physically abusive to his wife. Oswald had previously tried to murder an outspoken anti-communist and American general named Edwin Walker, he was unsuccessful in that assassination attempt. When he learned of John F. Kennedy coming to Dallas and the parade route was published in the paper, Lee Harvey Oswald decided that he would assassinate the President of the United States. Lee Harvey Oswald was never placed on trial for the assassination of President Kennedy because two days after he was arrested, he was being transferred out of his jail cell and in the police station was a man named Jack Ruby who assassinated Lee Harvey Oswald. Jack Ruby was a Dallas nightclub owner. He was a supporter of President Kennedy. He had ties to the mob. He had friends who were police officers, which is how he was able to get into the police station. And he was a hothead who simply wanted to avenge the death of the president. So he shot Lee Harvey Oswald, thus depriving all of us of getting 
Lee Harvey Oswald's testimony and his trial and leaving the, pres- the, the assassination of President Kennedy steeped in mystery. This was a day of terrible mourning. The nation was in shock from the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And as I said near the beginning of this lecture, this was really a turning point in American history. And it's a turning point in a way that's hard to define because from my understanding of American history, things just started to feel different after the Kennedy assassination. Now, I wish I could speak about this personally, but I can't because I was not born until 10 years after the Kennedy administration. I was not around when this happened. But there was, according to the testimony of those who were around at the time, There was, according to the best historians who wrote about this era, a change in the vibe of the United States. And I think this is because Kennedy, even though he was certainly a man with a lot of faults, even though historians don't really rank him as one of the best presidents in American history, he had a particular image, a charisma. Even though he was sick all the time and in a great deal of pain, he exuded energy. And when Kennedy was shot dead, it just deflated many people in the United States of America, especially the younger generation that was so inspired by his words. Also, it's not long after John F. Kennedy dies that the new war in Vietnam begins heating up. This is a war that will divide the nation, it will lead to protests in the streets, and it will force everybody, but in particular young people of the 1960s, to choose a side. It was very difficult to be neutral about the Vietnam War in the late 1960s. Then there was the Civil Rights Movement. It too was heating up at the time of the death of President Kennedy. And the Civil Rights Movement was growing more and more frustrated with the lack of progress that they'd been fighting for, especially over the course of the past 10 years and the emergence of Martin Luther King as the figurehead of the movement. So the late 1960s sees the United States of America getting ripped apart. And the assassination of President Kennedy seems to be this dividing line, this turning point in the chronology of American history. It feels as if our country was just a little bit more innocent and a little bit more hopeful, a little less cynical before John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And then after his death, our culture our nation, just started to get a little bit more sour. There was a great deal of mystery surrounding the Kennedy assassination. So the Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren was selected to lead an investigation on the Kennedy assassination. This was, named after Earl Warren, the Warren Commission. One individual, aside from Earl Warren, that's worth noting, who is on the Warren Commission, is the man seated seated on the far left of this picture, that is Gerald Ford. He will be in the middle of the 1970s, from 1974 to 1977, the President of the United States of America. The Warren Commission did an in-depth investigation on Lee Harvey Oswald and on Jack Ruby. They studied all of their connections. They spoke to a wide variety of people who were associated with these two men. And what they found was this. Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in his assassination of the president. He was not tied to anybody else or to any other organization. Not the Soviet Union, not Fidel Castro, not the CIA, not Lyndon B. Johnson, not the FBI, not J. Edgar Hoover. Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Jack Ruby also acted alone. He killed Lee Harvey Oswald because he was a hothead. Despite the fact that he was a fairly shady individual, he had ties with the police, he had ties with the mob, his legal job was running a nightclub in Dallas, a place where men come to get drunk and watch naked women dance in front of them. Even though he had this rather shady life, he too acted alone. He was a hothead who admired the president of the United States and who wanted to kill the man who killed the president. The Warren Commission published its findings. This publication was informally known as the Warren Report. And when it was originally released in September of 1964, for the most part, it was received positively. There was not a great deal of skepticism about the Warren Report. The Kennedy family it's themselves read over the Warren Report and accepted the conclusion of the Warren Commission. 
But then as the 1960s went on, and there were all of these truths that were discovered about the federal government of the United States of America and how the federal government had lied to the people about various things mostly associated with the Vietnam War, people started developing a greater skepticism and a greater cynicism about the United States government. People were just getting too suspicious, and a wide variety of conspiracy theories emerged. There are still today many conspiracy theories about the assassination of John F. Kennedy, as seen here in a fairly recent cover of the National Enquirer. In the early 1990s, there was a very famous movie called JFK. This film was very popular and it inspired a lot of Americans to continue to question whether or not Oswald acted alone. But as your history teacher, I tell you this, all of the historical evidence that we have right now suggests that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. There's simply no other substantial historical evidence that suggests that he was tied with any other person or any other organization. Lee Harvey Oswald was personally responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Now, if you are interested in the assassination of John F. Kennedy and learning more about it and all the conspiracy theories around it, the best documentary that I have seen is a fairly recent one, and it's simply, it was part of a, a series that CNN did called The 60s, and they did a one and a half hour episode on the series that is simply called The Assassination of President Kennedy. So if you're interested in learning more, I recommend looking up this particular documentary. Conspiracy theories aside, November of 1963 was a genuinely sad moment in American history. It was only a few days after John F. Kennedy's assassination when Life magazine was interviewing Jackie Kennedy, asking her what life in the White House was like. And even though it certainly was no picnic for Jackie Kennedy, Jackie did what she did best. She brought grace and wonderfulness to the situation by describing the time in the White House as being like Camelot. And the term stuck. Thank you, United States history students. You've made it through yet another one of my lectures. This concludes my lecture on the early 60s, Camelot, the John F. Kennedy administration. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a lot. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day.